the stream is now live. Found it. <laughs> Which email was it in? Oh my God. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. I'm uh, watching as people join us and marking them down. And we'll wait till we get to a quorum before we officially start. But we are live on the, the webinar. Uh, um, just, just to let you know. But again, I'll continue to watch as people join. And once we get to a quorum, then we'll officially take roll and get started. Thank you. Everybody. <clears throat> Dr. Lickey, you're muted if you're not muted. Hey, muted. David, you're muted. There I go again. You think that I would learn after I've done this now for four months to, to unmute myself. I was saying uh, I'm taking roll as people join us uh, and we'll wait till we get to quorum before we officially get started. But was also saying that we are uh, being broadcast right now. So just giving you a heads up. Thanks. All right. Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, it's four minutes after the hour, and uh, not all of our group has joined us, but counting heads, I think we're at quorum. So we'll go ahead and, and get started. I know several other folks will be joining us later today, 
obviously people are very busy with COVID and a variety of other things that are going on right, right now. Um, but uh, I anticipate again, other folks will join us in a, in a little bit. So, so why don't we officially take, take roll and then we'll add people after they have joined. Um, we'll start at the top of the list. Dr. Goodman. I'm here. Uh, Dr. Williams. Present. Uh, Dr. Liverson. Here. Uh, Dr. Harper. Here. Uh, Dr. Wakefield. Here. Nancy Trevino. I'm here. Welcome, uh, Dr. Trevino. Dr. Trevino is a new member. She's taking Kino's uh, position. Um, you want to introduce yourself to the group? Hi, uh, my name is Nancy Trevino. Uh, I am the new director of the Texas Tech uh, Mental Health Initiative. So I'm taking uh, the position that was previously held by Kano as he transitioned to be the secretary for the Board of Regents. So thank you guys for having me. I'm really excited to be a part of the group. Well, welcome. Glad to, that you're here. Thanks. Okay. Dr. Thompson. Sarah Martin. Dr. Pudowitz. Here. Uh, Dr. Chasse. Dr. Nimroff. Here. Okay. Dr. Strakowski. Dr. Tan. Dr. Robert. Here. Okay. Thank you. Dr. Wagner. Here. Okay. Dr. Vo, he told me that he's going to be a little bit late and he'll be joining us in about an hour. Dr. Suarez. Dr. Newland. I'm here. Okay, great. Dr. Plitska. I'm here. Okay. Uh, Dr. Blader. Dr. Iscamila. Uh, Mr. Petriarca, Michael, I think you're there. I see your name. Yeah, I'm here. Sorry about that. On mute. Okay. Jeffrey Matthews, Dr. Matthews, I see you. Uh, Brittany Nichols. Brittany will be the new individual from, from Tyler. Daniel DeLott has been pulled into the new medical school and all the activities that are taking place with, with it. And so um, Brittany will be taking his place. Dr. Tominga? Here. Uh, Dr. Ibrahim? I'm here. Doctor, like, I don't know if I was muted or not. Did you get that I was here? It's this yep. Liz. Okay. Yeah. Sonia Gaines? Mike Maples? Dr. Silverman told me she'll be late, but she'll be here. Ms. Wesley? Present. Okay. Andy Kelly? I'm here. Okay, great. Uh, Dr. Martinez? Good morning, David. Good morning. Danae Castle? Here. Okay. I'm here. And Dr. Borges? Here. Okay. Let me just count real quick. Dr. Chasse is here. And Joe Blader also joined probably after you called my name, David. Okay. Okay, with, with uh, Dr. Blader and Dr. Chesse, I think we're at 24, so we're definitely at quorum, so we can go ahead and get started. Again, appreciate everyone's time. Uh, I know you're extremely busy with everything that's going on uh, at your institutions with COVID and everything else, but I appreciate your work um, today, and the, thank you for the work that you're doing, um, you have been doing over the last several weeks to stand up the, the consortium. So a couple of little management issues. Um, again, would ask people to, under participants, if you have a question, to, to raise your hand. 
Uh, I will take a look at it. Uh, I think we can have some discussion without doing that, but if it starts where we're talking over each other just because of the technology, uh, I'll ask you to, to, to raise your hand and then to, to lower your hand after you've spoken. Uh, I'll try to do the votes by roll call. We don't have very many votes today. Uh, if there's any controversy with it, then I'll, I'll take the roll call, but I, I think we can do most things today by uh, voice, vo voice, voice vote, sorry. Um, and we'll try to do a lunch around noon, try to make 30 minutes. We'll try to find a natural break and, uh, and then take, take a break. But again, I, I think we should be good with the, the time we have today. And hopefully we can get out a little bit early because uh, I know again that everyone's very busy. So that the first order of business, everyone should have a copy of the, the minutes. I would ask you to take a quick look at it uh, and then we'll need to have a motion and approval of the minutes. Move to approve. Second. Okay, I have a motion by uh, Dr. Podolwitz. Who, who was a second? Carol T Taminga. Carol Taminga is a second? Yes. Any further discussion? Hearing none, all in favor of approving the minutes signify by saying aye. 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 Okay. Anybody abstain? Any no votes? All right, the minutes approve with the unanimous approval. Uh, next, let's move into item three on the agenda. The first part of that is to look at the logo. At the last meeting, I think we had a pretty firm direction from this group to take the, the logos back and to um, work on it and get a subcommittee. Uh, we, we had a um, some folks here within our system work on some ideas. They have talked to various members and I think we've landed on a, a nice place for the logo. But uh, Dan Oppenheimer, why don't you uh, <coughs> join us and talk through the, the logo um, results and kind of where we ended up. Sure. Um, can everybody see my screen? Yes. Yeah, okay. So uh, that's right. We had, so we had in the last meeting vested a smaller work group with the authority to choose a logo. So uh, we met and consulted and came back with a new kind of uh, scrapped the old round, started with a new one, taking the, the sort of dictate that we include Texas as the foundation of the new logo. So I, I, I just, I'll take you briefly through kind of, you know, just the construction of that logo. And then I, a few other quick things that I'm just gonna add on at the end, but feel free to interrupt any point so so it started with and I think all of you have seen the logo so you you know uh, there's not a you here so it started with a chat box um, kind of to indicate technology and communication then you can kind of see how we tilted that on its side added another one and then created from that uh, you know an abstraction of the shape of Texas um, and then this is just showing kind of in different applications so this is you know, this, the, the, the logo itself will go with the consortium acronym, with CPAN, with TCHAT. If we need to add in things like for research or the workforce expansion, we can do that. I don't think that's necessary now, and we may not decide to do that, but it's flexible in that sense. And then there are the basic colors, the red, white, and blue, but there's also variations, the, the you know, the clear or black and white, depending on what the you know, what the usage is. Um, so I, I just wanted to show you, we've set up and, and I'll share this link. You can see the link for it at the bottom, but you don't need to remember it. Uh, we'll share it with everybody. We set up a Google Drive fo folder that has um, everything we have currently. We want, want to make that available to you to download. Um, so it's going to have the logos, but it's also going to have uh, some one pagers. We actually have three or four one pagers for CPAN. I think we have one or two um, you can see see them there. Uh, we have one or two for TChat, and and one some of these are ones we've developed in house. Other ones are we took stuff that you guys created out of the institutions and just redesigned them, um, removing the specific institutional logos and just substituting in the the new consortium logo or the CPAN logo. Um, we have a quick facts document we created. Uh, we're going to make all that available for you. And then the last thing that I wanted to show you, or maybe let me pause and just ask if there's any questions or comments. Um, 
about the logo and just the way of disseminating it. And then there's one more thing I wanted to show you. I think it looks great, Daniel. Good job. Thank you. I'll take credit, but it was really our designer, M, who, uh, who came up with it. So I'll pass that on to him. He may be watching. Um, the last thing I wanted to show you, and, and we don't have this quite set up, but we're moving as fast as we can. We're trying to figure out how to balance the fact that we want to have kind of a centralized branding for the initiative, but we recognize that each of you need to be able to go out and do your own stuff. And also in some cases, put your own logos on, on documents along with this, you know, consortium logo. And so we're working on something. There's an online platform called Canva. I'm not sure if any of you have used it before, but it's, it's, it's kind of for situations like this. Um, and what it lets you do is create templates and then um, do some very intuitive, simple kind of drag and drop. Um, so this is just a screenshot of it. But what we're going to do is we'll take these documents that we've created and upload them as templates onto that, and everybody will have a login. And it's very easy, and I just have the Tyler logo as an example, um, to, and I won't actually be able to do it. But what you would do is basically just drag and drop. So you would pull this logo over right here. We'll make sure there's a space on these documents so you can co-brand. Um, you can also click on the background colors. Um, so if you wanted to change them to your institutional colors, we'll make sure that those those colors are uploaded as well. Um, Cause it, it makes it very easy to just kind of modify aspects of the thing. So optimally what we'll do is we'll create a document where the basic design aspects of it are locked, but you can add your own logo. You can change the colors to reflect your institution and you can tweak the text, which in some cases may be necessary if you wanted to, for instance, add phone numbers, uh, you know, for your institution or in some cases, we're, we're adapting one pagers from the institutions that may reflect something that's specific to the CPAN uh, group that's you know in one region that may not be applicable for another region. So uh, hopefully, what this will let you do is even if you don't have designers on your team, um, just somebody who's, who's minimally savvy with this stuff can come in and customize the document on here and then download it as a, as a PDF onto their um, desktop and, and do with it what they will. So that's the, that's the plan. It might take us another week or two uh, or a few weeks to get this system up in place. But, but as of right now, we'll send you this link that I put up above and you'll be able to access the logos and the one pagers and there's some PowerPoint templates and there's some letterhead and so on so that you guys should have at least the beginnings of what you need uh, from our end to do, do outreach. That is so nice, Daniel. It will help us really move some of our marketing forward in an organized way so quickly. I'm, I'm just, thank you for your thinking through what we need to do. You're welcome, thank you. All right, any other comments? Yes, I agree. This is, I'm at the logo, it's just, so fantastic. Uh, I was so excited when I saw it. Um, I really appreciate it. And I do think that this page, this thing you just, what'd you call it? Can, canvas? Canva, or like can canvas without an S at the end. Okay. I think this is, I, I agree. It's going to really help the teams. And so I appreciate it. Thank you. I have Who worked with Canva. Oh. Love it. I have worked with Canva and it is super easy to use. It's very user friendly. That was a great idea, Daniel. Thank you. Party on. Very good. All right. Any other comments for Daniel before we um, move on to the next part of our agenda? And before I do that, I see several executive members have joined us uh, since the, the last kind of roll call. Uh, I see Steve Strakowski is here. Steve, yeah, I see. 
I, I've I, listed as Mike Maples. And you can debate which of us is a better version of Mike Maples. I think the old one is. <laughs> so, so, so. <laughs> but can someone, can someone please resend me the link? I've sent several requests out. So, so, so you, you can go up into the, the, the top of your box and hit the, the three red, three. Oh, I can change buttons. myself. Okay. And, and, and change your name to whatever you want to put your name down. There you go. <laughs> Got it. But, but 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 Dr. Stokowski, you have to grow a beard. I'm catching up with Dr. Escamilla, though. Yeah, I, I, my it comes in gray, which is not a good look for any of us. <laughs> and, and Mike, uh, Escamilla, speak for yourself, okay? Any, anybody else besides Steve, Mike, and, and Michael that have joined us? Yeah, yeah, yeah I joined. Oh, hi, Dr. Lakey. Who, who is that? Hi, Dr. Lakey. This is Brittany Nichols. I, I was trying to sign in on a Mac and having some technical problems. So I'm in now, but I'm calling in by phone okay. um, for audio. So, so thank you uh, and welcome, Brittany. Uh, to, we, I told folks before you got on that you're taking Daniel's uh, position, but it's really great to have you as part of, of this group. So thank you. Thank you. Yeah. All and, right. uh, I'm here now too, Dr. Lakey, Sarah okay. Martin from El Paso. Thanks, Dr. Martin. All right, I think we have most of the folks here then. Wait, why don't we go ahead and move forward then with the, the agenda. The, the next item, I wanted to update everyone on the progress related to the program evaluation and the work that the University of Texas at Austin will be doing with us as part of our team. Molly, I saw you earlier, Dr. Lopez, uh, you wanna update us on the work that you'll be doing? Sure, absolutely. Um, I wish I had something as exciting as Daniel to share and visually, um, but we um, are on board as of about three weeks ago. We're really excited to join in on the exciting work that's happening. Um, our initial focus is really on diving into some of the details. We've been attending the executive committee meetings for a while so that we're up to speed, but now we're excited to kind of dive into the details and really understand all of the work that's gone on to date so that we can kind of continue to um, develop from that around the evaluation pieces. We will be having an evaluation position um, posted, I think in the next day or two. So if you know of folks that you think would like to join in on this work, please feel free to send them our way. We're looking for um, a great team member to join us. And then our first activities are going to be really to focus in on developing logic models for each of the four initiatives. We'll use that as the basis then for our evaluation plan. So really over the next, we've, we've started and then over the next couple of weeks, we'll have a draft evaluation plan across the four different initiatives. Um, a part of that is going to be doing some definitional work around the metrics that you all have identified um, as sort of core um, metrics that you want to track along the way. So we'll try to do some definitional work to make sure that across each of the HRIs, everybody is using sort of the same framework for what those um, metrics mean, and we're all collecting the data in the same way. Um, so we look forward to kind of the next steps, which I think we'll be getting input on those things that we're developing from folks. Um, and really kind of um, bringing that back to the group. All right, well, welcome. It's good to have you here. A any questions for Dr. Lopez about the, what they will be doing? All right, hearing none, Th thank you. Again, she'll be working very closely with our team in, in many ways, part of our internal team to make sure that we or watching our metrics, make sure we're, we're moving forward on all of our initiatives and, and really excited for them to be part of our team. So we've, we've talked before that we're gonna have the this internal evaluation, but we're also wanting to set up this external evaluation. Uh, so we have somebody that's an arm's length from us that will um, have a, a, a real honest, critical look at what we're doing, how we can do it better, and um, work then with the legislature to say, this is how we need to tweak things or, or move things, things forward. And so Nagla, why don't you give an update related to that process of selecting the external evaluation? Sure, um, we are in the process right now of uh, putting together the RFP 
Um, we are looking at the timelines of when the RFP is going to go out. Um, and so we're looking at um, either kind of the last days of um, June to beginning of July. Uh, for that, we are hoping, um, we're looking at only releasing it for a couple of weeks, just given the timelines and the need to bring someone on and uh, with the hope of uh, starting um, a contractor in uh, August. So uh, we're just in the process right now of uh, finalizing that RFP. Uh, and just a reminder uh, that uh, it is going to be limited to Texas institutions and that um, medical schools that are currently involved um, in this consortium are, are not gonna be eligible to apply, um, given that this is an independent external evaluation. Any questions? Yes, uh, yes, there is a question here. You said medical school, you don't say the institutions. Th that, that is right, Israel, and, and so, a school of public health at one of the institutions could play a role in, in, in that. Uh, or you, there's different think tanks at the, the different academic institutions. They would be eligible, but, but not a medical school. And so that we won't be doing our self-evaluation. There is some distance uh, there. But, but a, another institution that's not under that medical school would be eligible. OK, thanks. Okay. Any other questions? David Zoctavia, a quick question. Couldn't uh, unmute for, for Molly, but uh, now that also Nagel has spoken, in reference to the evaluations, uh, either the uh, program or the external, or maybe both, will there be any look at uh, the involvement of uh, peers or consumers in the process and or uh, the activities of, um, uh, of TCMHCC? Nagla, you want to address that one? There's been discussions, um, Molly as well, uh, um, you know, uh, both on the internal and external side. Um, first of all, looking at uh, the processes and conducting maybe a survey related to how the uh, activities and the meetings and the processes are being conducted and uh, how to improve on that as well. Um, and as far as the external evaluation, um, that is going to look at the infrastructure and the workings of each one of the different initiatives. And that would include, I believe, um, the um, involvement of the community, the involvement of stakeholders within those activities. Um, and so kind of looking at the differences in the models and in the implementation of the models to achieve the outcomes of each of the initiatives. Oh, good, good. That's good to hear. Uh, I just bring it up because uh, we as the co executive committee have uh, mentioned it and, and talked about peer and consumer and recognize its importance, but uh, want to make sure it also gets captured in the valuation. Because uh, I think it's really important, David, as uh, you're talking with and other representatives here to our policy stakeholders, that they see that in fact, you know, we are listening to and including the community in, in, the, in the work that uh, uh, T, uh, TC and HCC is doing. So good to hear. Thank you. No, I, I, I agree, Octavio, and, and so I think that they will be involved. Um, we'll have to see what the external, the external evaluation applicants um, put in their report on how they will use them, um, but I, I don't see how they would not be somehow in communication in, in that evaluation in order to have a real thoughtful process of what we're doing. Okay. And, and one of the criteria that we've added in there is that they need to look at it more from a local implementation perspective, including looking at how they're engaging their local community in, um, in achieving that. So that, that is one of the criteria we'd expect um, anybody putting a proposal to add. Okay. All right. Well, why don't we go to the, the next item? Wanted to do brief updates on the community psychiatric workforce expansion and then the, the, the fellowship program. Although the, most of the day we'll be talking about CPAN, TCHAT and, and the research initiatives, but th those other initiatives also are really important. And so Dr. Plitska, you wanna give an update uh, on the uh, workforce expansion? 
up oh, you're muted do you want me to show the documents I sent in now, or will that come again later? Is this the, the main you, you show? You can show them now if you want to. Okay, very okay. good. Um, let me I see. Can I share my screen, or do you want to show them for me? I can show them for you if you tell me which ones you want to start okay, with. Okay, let's start with the, uh, the, the Excel spreadsheet, the uh, CPW, the C, CPW uh, June 2020. <clears throat> Um, you all have this. I won't go over it in detail, uh, but what it basically shows is that uh, basically all of the institutions have uh, are pushing forward and are either already uh, have executed contracts with various uh, community mental health centers or are planning to do so uh, either you know with it you know certainly before the end of the calendar year uh, and are, and where there are delays, it's usually due to uh, pending uh, recruitment of recruitment of faculty, but in generally good progress in terms of filling these FTEs uh, across the uh, centers. If you want to just very slowly scroll to the bottom there, so people can see all that all the different sites are represented. Or is UNT at the bottom? Is UNT the last one? I think we go down a little bit. Is there anyone below them? Yeah, I think UTGV RGV is down there, and. Uh, Lubbock is in the planning phase. Um, so uh, actually UT Tyler has also got, I, somehow that didn't get attached to that particular one. Um, I, I'll, I'll update that before the, we entered into the minutes. Okay, um, if we close, uh, if we close uh, this one, and would you open the uh, community psychiatry workforce expansion metrics? So uh, one thing the workforce is, is focusing on is giving a little bit more operational operationalization to the broader metrics. Uh, some of these are very straightforward, such as the number of faculty and residents assigned. Uh, we uh, want to minimize the amount of number crunching that either the LMHAs or the sites have to do. We want to extract data that's readily available. So for metric, metric two and three, uh, the LMHAs all have systems of tracking their EM services. And there's another attachment that goes into some degree of detail about how the billing systems can be queried uh, to obtain that particular uh, information. And for those sites that are also seeing adults as part of CPWE, we can then very easily calculate that ratio uh, we wish to define, uh, rather than talk about wait lists, the relevant uh, CPUE metric would be the time between the intake or when a psychiatric referral is made and the appointment with a prescriber. And that again is easily operationalized within the current LMHA um, uh, data gathering mechanisms. And then number six, we clarify that we're we're not, ex we're not trying to capture everybody in CPAN and TCHAT who might end up in the CPWE program. We clarify that if you have all three programs and you are referring your own patients or your own individuals from CPAN to TCHAT into your CPWE program, that we track those individuals and that should be relatively easy to do. Uh, and then finally on the performance net network uh, metrics, uh, clearly, it's going to take some long-term work to look at uh, residents who ultimately work in the community mental health systems. Uh, that won't be relevant for this year. Now, in terms of measuring clinical outcome, we also were very concerned that we not impose any additional burden. But we were pleased to discover that all of the LMHAs use the Texas Child and Adolescent Needs and Strengths. Uh, these are done generally at baseline in every 90 days, and they quite adequately cover all of the major psychiatric diagnoses, as well as other functional measures of interest. So uh, again, we'll be able to extract these, and the workforce was, again, uh, was of the view that this should be sufficient. Uh, so as all of the 
LMHA, uh, CPWE sites come online, uh, we'll be working to set up the mechanisms to uh, draw out the, these data or ask the, H, the HRAs to continue to dialogue with their LMHA in terms of uh, uh, extracting that data on a regular basis. So I'll stop there and answer any questions that people have. Hey, this is Octavio. A quick question. Uh, looks great. Uh, I would just uh, just uh, also interested if you guys have thought about considering this is a workforce um, initiative, uh, also tracking uh, the diversity of the workforce. That's been an issue, obviously, for. Uh, for healthcare uh, and even in psychiatry, how diverse are we? You know, ethnicity, language, bicultural aspects. I don't think it'd be too too tough, but it'd be nice no, to not at all capture the individuals of who's coming through the program. Yes, absolutely. That can be easily integrated into uh, tracking metric number one, and we we will do that. I'll add that to uh, this chart. <laughs> I'd like to hear from some other members that have had some experience with this th thus far. Um, you know, it, the impression that I've received so thus far is, is that, um, and, and Danette, you know, you may be able to, to talk about this, but that this is being well received by the, the local mental health authorities. And we've had a, a couple of other requests that if there's opportunities, could you potentially do this in, in our local mental health authority, either in person or uh, as Dr. Escamilla presented last time, um, or, or, or maybe a couple of months ago, the, the work that they're doing through through telemedicine. But, but Danette, what kind of reaction are you getting from local mental health authorities? So the reaction is, um, if I'm not a site, when can I be a site? Okay. So we had, uh, as you know, good response um, from the field. Uh, not 100% of all of the local mental health authorities deemed that they were prepared for um, being a site for this project um, for the residents, but uh, a high number of them did, the greatest proportion uh, did. And so those that uh, are interested and not a site today are very interested in knowing uh, what the potential will be for the future. Those who are involved are um, looking forward to this, particularly uh, thinking about longer term outcomes in terms of uh, having psychiatrists, having uh, community psychiatry experience, uh, working with people who have serious mental illness and often co-occurring substance addiction. So really pleased with that. Also grateful that there's not a lot of additional um, expectations in terms of data collecting. So the consideration of the group and our folks were involved in uh, the leadership uh, with uh, Dr. Pliska as he led our uh, subcommittee uh, in these conversations. So really grateful that uh, they're looking to the kind of data that we have available in order to get to um, uh, the metrics and evaluation of the performance. So really positive. And, um, and then looking forward to um, opportunity for the future. Thanks, I think that's very helpful. How about from any of the other executive committee members that, that are currently doing this and haven't stood up? Okay. I, I do have one follow-up question, a clarifying question actually to Dr. Martinez. Um, I was hearing his um, expression of, of desire to get to an understanding of the diversity. And I was wanting to be sure that uh, Dr. Martinez, you were uh, making a point regarding uh, diversity of the workforce, uh, but wondering if you also had kind of a question in regard to uh, the diversity of the population of people who are accessing care. Oh, Dina, I think that's a really good point. I was uh, really just concentrating more on making sure we capture the diversity of the workforce since it was a, it's a workforce initiative. Uh, but I think your point's well taken. It would be nice because the other issue that often comes up we look at uh, right in public health especially is the matching between the populations and, um, and, and the diverse workforce uh, that is needed. So um, I'll leave it to Steve. If, if that could be maybe incorporated if it it's not too burdensome, but that, I think mean, that's a great point in it. I like that. 
And, and so I'm not sure I'm so much suggesting that it get added as a metric right now, but I do think it could be important to gather the information so that we do, we learn from it and we give consideration to it. Um, because as we know, there are great disparities in regard to access to healthcare. Um, and it would be, I think, good information. We do look at it from time to time. We know those disparities remain, um, but it could be something to have in front of us uh, in terms of looking to the future and adding uh, a measure in the future. I, I concur. Any other feedback or any other challenges that uh, people are seeing right now? Hearing none, why don't we move to the next. Thanks, Dr. Plitska, and, and thanks for moving that forward. With the Child and Adolescent uh, Psychiatry, the, the fellowships, uh, any updates related to how that's playing out right now and thinking come next year, any changes in your plans related to what we have um, put into place? I think, Dr. Leakey, I think we have some successes to talk about, some early successes, um, which is really positive. Um, so I can go over these briefly, um, starting with, uh, with Baylor. Um, as you know, they did um, expand by two in uh, the last match and are planning to do so again in the upcoming match. Um, and there's a partnership between Texas A&M and Baylor Scott White, which I understand is moving forward with plans to um, add, I think by one additional child fellow in the upcoming match. Um, and in speaking with um, Texas Tech, um, they're making good progress on their planning grant. Um, they're not yet accredited, but they do anticipate that moving forward. Um, they have some uh, promising recruitments for board certified uh, faculty, and that was um, a small hiccup in their, in their process. Um, but they do anticipate launching in July 2021. Um, that would add two more additional child fellowship spots. Um, same with Texas uh, Tech University Health Science Center, El Paso. Um, the GME and ACGME committees approved expansion to six fellows. Um, they're currently in the process of adding additional educational resources to their program and they report receiving really wonderful high level support um, on, on really all levels from ACGME, GME to their department chair and the consortium. Um, I will say um, for our department and our institution, we're also planning to expand and are well underway with our applications for expansion with the ACGME. Um, and anticipate um, a strong match this year. Um, let's see, I believe uh, UT Health Science Center San Antonio is also planning to expand by one this year. Um, and if anyone, if I've got any of these incorrect, please uh, don't to say something. Um, UT Health Science Center Tyler is still working on their planning grant as anticipated. And um, UT Rio Grande Valley is also working to expand um, with their application with the ACGME. Um, they still have a bit of time. Um, and so there's, um, you know, I think in an ideal case scenario, we had hoped to have three new CAP training programs and a total of 19 additional fellows. We're gonna be a little shy of our goal, but still making very strong progress. This was, we knew this was a very ambitious goal to start with, so. Dr. Borges, I see your hand. And I think you may have stepped out of the room when she noted the, oh. the partnership, but, but you have a question, go ahead. Yeah, I, we are adding one fellow to our program. I had to step out to take a call. Yeah, yeah, to totally understand. Uh, and she noted that on her, her list of the, the, the partnership was between you and A&M and, and the, the fellow. Thank you. Yeah. And that, that's it. No, no, thank you, Dr. Newland. Any, any comments from anybody? Doc, Dr. Nimroff? I, I saw some email traffic, um, it must have been a couple of weeks ago, where, where you were looking at expanding some training programs there at, at Dell that, that the initially didn't ask for the funds, but, but now as things are growing, see that there's some opportunities. I uh, guess one, one clarification in my mind, is that for partnership with the local mental health authority through the residency or through fellowship and, and development of fellowship? 
Through, res through the residency um, in collaboration with the local mental health authority with integral. Okay. So if there is such uh, availability, we'd be keen to have that conversation. Okay. So, so we're going to be talking about some of those opportunities later today, kind of the process of going through those. And, and just, just want to make sure that some of the things that I've heard or seen in emails that we uh, lay it out in front of everybody, because uh, I think there's some of those questions that we're going to need to try to figure out how do we move some resources here or there in order to address some of these opportunities. Thank you, David. Just want to, again, have you had the chance to, have to voice that? Okay. Any other questions related to the, the fellowships? All right. Hearing none, why don't we go then to item number four, the updates related to the research initiative, um, including the opportunities, challenges, and questions, milestones. Uh, Loanne, you wanna start this and then bring in Dr. Tominga? Sure, I'd love to start this. Between the May meeting and this meeting, we have accomplished many things relating to the research, which is great because, as you know, it's the last initiative to get rolled out. And so we made a lot of key decisions at the May meeting. Between then and now, we have been able to release some of the participating institution agreement amendments. Um, we currently have those sent out to some of the HRIs that have completed their node budget proposals. And we have one fully executed with University of Texas Health Science Center in San Antonio, Dr. Pliska. Guys, we're very quick to, in terms of turnaround, and so we're very pleased about that. The Baylor College of Medicine amendment as well is in process internally here at UT System for our president's signature. And once that is accomplished, we'll send that on to the Texas Higher Education Coordinating Board. We have several amendments that are currently being edited um, due to some last minute uh, modifications. And we are working with Texas A&M, UT RGV and UT Bell right now on those with potential work with UT Southwest as well to accomplish those. And once those are finished, we'll move those through the process. So. Um, right now we have, and I, and I apologize, I know many of you probably think, good Lord, I've got another email from Luann about this, but <laughs> I'm really trying to, to get this done so that we can get this revenue to you uh, as quickly as possible so you can get started. So I wanted to be able to provide that update. Does anybody have any questions about um, anything in relation to the amendments, where we're at in the process, things like that? Okay, excellent. All right, very good. Dr. Tominga, anything from you? Well, I hardly I, I have to be the spokesperson anymore since I'm really very proud of all the work that the group has done. Uh, Luann is talking about all the work that she's doing and we're terribly grateful about that. The reason that she's doing all this work is because both networks, um, the depression network with uh, Dr. Trevetti and the Childhood Trauma Network with Dr. Nemeroth have really stood up their groups and um, have had several meetings and have each one of the networks have full organizations for how they're gonna accomplish the goals of the network. And I won't, uh, I, I'll, I'll let the two of them be able to talk about and, and describe the work of their network. Um, but I think that this is a terribly exciting time for me anyway for seeing all of these uh, dreams come to life and to see the uh, possibilities around the state of Texas uh, uh, to develop these research networks come into a reality. Um, David and Luann can know how long we've uh, looked forward to this and I can tell you it's becoming a reality and it's just ter ter terribly nice. And my, uh, my thanks and kudos to Maduka Trevetti and his network and Charlie Nemeroff and his group. Thank, thank you, Carol. Thank you, Dr. Tominga. Uh, Dr. Nemeroff, anything you want to say, uh, kind of a short, a cut, very short kind of synopsis of the, the work that's been taking place over the last month? Absolutely. So <clears throat> we had a terrific network meeting of all the nodes, and we went over the near final protocol. There's been a tremendous amount of cooperation uh, from a number of people who are on this call right now. 
So Michael Escamilla stepped up and he's chairing the Acculturation, Ethnicity and Patient Advocacy Committee. Um, and he's helping also with training. So uh, Michael has been terrific about helping us get translations into Spanish of several of the rating scales we're using that were not available uh, in the Spanish language. Uh, the protocol is virtually done. Dr. Lieberzon is a member of the protocol committee and he's also uh, stepped up and he's gonna chair the committee that will look at add-on projects and, and additional grant submissions uh, based on the network. And Dr. Suarez is a member of that committee uh, as well. Um, we also have a statistician from Texas A&M that we brought on board to the hub to help with the statistical expertise. So Dr. Newport's done a terrific job. Um, and we intend to have monthly network meetings and every Q2 week uh, hub meetings. Um, we're, we're pretty much settled on the protocol. It's been a little back and forth about one or another um, uh, item. The patient advocacy members um, uh, uh, have been just terrific in terms of providing input, Octavia, uh, but Stephanie and David as well. So I couldn't be more heartened and we're very excited and we're hoping that we'll be able to launch sometime in August. Okay, very good. All right. Dr. Trevetti, uh, do you have a quick update? Similarly, I think we've been very exciting uh, developments. We've engaged with a lot of <clears throat> people uh, in the network. So Dr. Escamilla, Dr. Livingston, Eric Storch, I don't see Dr. Storch, Jair, uh, in very many components, and Dr. Wakefield is here. Bottom line is we've been meeting very regularly and a lot of uh, <clears throat> uh, finalization. So the protocol is almost ready to go to IRB. As you know, both for both the networks, UT Southwestern has taken the responsibility of organizing the central IRB. So we are working closely with our IRB and administration. They are reaching out to a lot of institutions and, and more will come. Uh, by the way, Luann, your emails are most welcome because they are so, so solution focused. So I appreciate your input and, uh, and moving things along because there was a whole lot of questions about how the amendments and the funding is going to come through. And, that is beginning to pay off. So thank you very much. Uh, I, I think we are very much geared, as Charlie said, I can keep on elaborating what everyone is doing, but I think the proof is gonna be in the pudding and that is have the IRB approval and start launching for the different, we have both networks have a lot of common elements and a lot some di major differences. So we actually have to be very, thoughtful about ensuring that once a child uh, is identified, how best does the clinical site then deliver the care so that we don't end up with usual care, but more elevated care, because usual care, as we all know in the United States and, and anywhere, is not as, as prime as we want. And so that component, for example, Dr. Cho Storch and Dr. Wakefield will be chairing the measurement-based care committee and organizing the training and the, uh, and we have a lot of materials but training as well as implementation we'll have uh, <clears throat> report cards that everyone will have etc so i think that our challenges in some ways are exciting uh, but we are uh, and i have been talking reg more regularly than uh, <laughs> than ever before so we are geared to setting up the irbs and uh, going very rapidly so that we can start enrolling and make this uh, real by having participants in both all the, all the networks. Uh, a lot of work is going on in the background in terms of setting up the data architecture, databases, uh, <coughs> creating uh, reviewable dashboards, et cetera, for, for us so that we can monitor we have sent out information for each of the nodes and we will be communicating with individually with nodes to figure out that it'll still be a kind of a hub and a spoke model at each of the nodes also because not all participants will come from the academic in-house medical center. So therefore it will be in the community. And uh, I think that the way we are planning and the way all the nodes are really excited we will end up with a very robust 
functioning research network that can do any kind of research study that can parallel any of the networks on the coasts, let me tell you, this will be a fantastic network. So I appreciate everybody's support. Um, David, if I could just, I was remiss in not um, uh, shouting out Karen Wagner, who's the co-lead of the uh, Trauma Network and has been worked tirelessly uh, with us on multiple calls and knotty issues that uh, are too complicated to even talk about, but I want to acknowledge her tr tremendous contribution. And I, I think that uh, maybe Dr. Wakefield, do you want to add anything? Well, the only um, thing I wanted to talk about was I sent um, a document that w has been an agreement, a reciprocal IRB agreement between and among all of our institutions. Um, when I talked with, when I spoke with our IRB here, being a non-UT system IRB, they said that that document expires at the end of this month, um, and we're not aware. Uh, I mean, it has been extended. Um, several times in the past, but had not received communication about that being extended again. Um, so this doesn't prohibit us from working together through one IRB by any means. It would just necessitate single agreements between um, UT system or UT Southwestern IRB and the non-system UT system um, HRIs. But if we had that agreement in place, I think that it would be much easier to facilitate these things in the future. I didn't know if anybody had heard anything about that or had gotten any additional information. Well, let me pull in David Lean, because when I got your email, I asked him to take a, a, a quick look at, at it. And, and David, correct me if I'm wrong, um, but I think UT Southwestern was looking at another the real um, IRB as another alternative to, to have that kind of collaboration. And so they're, they're rethinking right now of whether they sign the, the, the current um, agreement, uh, it, it needs to be renewed. And so there are some internal conversations at UT Southwestern right now related to them being part of, of that. And partly again, because of that other shared IRB system that, that they're look, looking at. David, did, did I get that wrong? Uh, or is there anything else you'd like to add to that? No, you didn't get that wrong. And uh, the way I understand it, I, I don't even think that the other system that they're looking at, I don't think the two are mutually exclusive. I think they could do they could do both. They just, UT Southwestern just needs to, to finish its internal conversations about what it wants to do about that extension. So, so, so Carol, that may be something that you take back to your institution to, to look at um, whether uh, UT Southwestern is gonna sign that continuation of that shared IRB. Okay. okay. It, uh, Dr. Lakey, it would, uh, Dr with David Lean, you would be the right person because people at our institution and the <clears throat> dean's office are asking who I would connect with. Well, should it be Dr. Lake or you, or how do I? Regarding I didn't hear your question. I think as these things happen, the process is not uh, going to be straightforward in the sense there are too many different groups that have to uh, to uh, to agree to at each of the institutions. So there is somebody centrally at the university UT level that we can have a contact with that might help. So, so, so how about if we take that offline and <laughs> maybe later this week you get a conversation, Carol, with you and, and Dr. Trevetti and, and, Dr. Lean and Luann and I, let's figure out if we can map out that process of, of figuring out what UT Southwestern is going to, the stance that they're going to take related to that. Sure. Uh, the people at UT Southwestern that would take that, you these would be the IRB people. That's what you're thinking, David, isn't it? I, I believe that's right. I, I have a name and I can shoot it to you if you want to coord help coordinate, yeah. but yeah, we'll, we'll do that do. offline. Please yeah. do. I, it's Rhonda Olympia. Okay. Any other questions for the, the research group? One item that I have related to the research initiative is if you remember back at our last meeting uh, when the University of North Texas Health Science Center said that they couldn't be part of this right now because of the growth and the things that they're doing and their, their priorities uh, there was a amount of money three hundred eighty thousand dollars that has not been allocated for specific projects uh, and my commitment at that meeting was that we would be very transparent related to how we would allocate those dollars. Uh, Mark, if something changes, uh, Dr. Chase, if something changes there, let us know. We want to make sure that we honored that 
that agreement. But, but if it doesn't change, we want to have a transparent process to decide how we're going to allocate those dollars. So, so Mark, I've seen that you've taken your, your, your phone off mute. Anything you want to say? Uh, appreciate that uh, uh, your stance on that, and uh, we look forward to uh, trying to find ways in which we could capture that. Okay. So I want to be transparent related to how those dollars uh, I've heard from various uh, individuals throughout this you know, last several months, uh, what some of their ideas would be. Uh, and so what I think would be a good process or a, a reasonable process, let me get, get your feedback is that we send out a email, Luann will send out an email with a template to get your ideas of what you think are some of those needs in order to make the research initiatives successful. Um, we will bring that back at the next meeting and have a discussion related to that. And then in the August meeting, have the final vote related to how those dollars would be, be allocated. Uh, I, I've heard you know, the, the Dr. Nimrov, I've heard you related to the need for patient incentives. I think that's one, one thing that will need to be part of that conversation. I've heard, um, Michael, in, in your conversation before this, that there were some other items that you thought would be important. I think other people have uh, various ideas. Uh, obviously, we can't do everything, but I want to do it in a transparent way, and we'll do it through the full executive committee, again, by sending you out some information gathering that information, having that conversation here at the next meeting, and then finalizing that in April of how those dollars could be, be used. But does that sound reasonable to everybody? So David, I'll take the uh, uh, opportunity to respond for the, for, for the research committee and for the networks. I, and I think that this is a transparent and a wonderful way for every single person to get their nomination out there and uh, for everything to get considered. Thank you. Okay. Dr. Lakey, would that be something that is a enhancement of the network activity or it could be a standalone separate? No, so, so this is to improve these research initiatives. There were, when we were putting these together, there was um, some things that people said that would be nice to be able to do to make the, the hubs, the nodes work better, um, whether there were patient incentives or some different uh, groups to help advise. I, I'm, not, I'm not prioritizing any of those right now, um, but again, the goal would be to make the research hubs and system work better. What are some of those gaps and how could those limited funds hopefully help enhance that? Again, it's not a huge amount. Uh, you know, it sounds like a large amount of money, $380,000. Um, uh, can't, can't fill all the gaps, but, but could enhance um, Hence these initiatives if we do it smartly. And again, I, I want that to be a open conversation with the full executive committee. Okay. Great. Thank you. Okay. So, so look forward to that. Uh, Luann will be sending something out to you. And again, timeline, that will be an agenda item for the next meeting. We'll discuss that and uh, plan that we'll have the final vote then on that in, in August. Okay. Great. David. Um, is this the open part of the discussion for uh, research? Yes. Okay. Uh, just a comment and then an ask of uh, the executive committee and, and you as the uh, our chair. One, I want to commend the uh, research committee and group for involving the, the peer and consumers. Uh, I think that's been just uh, fabulous the way you guys have been working with them and also uh, the uh, um, culturation and ethnicity and patient advocacy committee that now uh, Charlie asked uh, Michael to head up, which is, I think it's great. Uh, here's the ask, though. Uh, I know we started with, and Lou Ann and I, uh, with the uh, executive committee, uh, if you guys recall, uh, asked us to be able to bring that to uh, the research group. So we pulled together a core group of uh, consumer and family uh, folks, um, and it's a really good, I think, core committee. Uh, it started with the research group, and here's the ask. Uh, as I'm looking at that and seeing the value and thinking about the overall concept of the consortium, uh, is the executive committee, I would recommend that this core you know, consumer committee, which could advise and inform not only in research, but really also at the regional level with the nodes, uh, working with, with them to in, involve consumer and family folks uh, when they're doing their clinical work and any activities, also thinking about the evaluations we're gonna be doing. 
So what uh, to, to today, I'm not sure if it's a motion or it's just a discussion at this point, is really considering that we have a peer consumer committee that is for the whole consortium and not just research. Though that's where it was needed at the, at, at the moment and where it's, I think it's been valuable, but I'm also seeing the bigger picture or looking at that and just wanted to see what my colleagues and committee member, the executive committee thought of uh, actually formalizing uh, a peer consumer committee that would help advise and inform. I think it would be a core a group much like we are because it would interface then with regionally and, and across the state of Texas with each of the nodes and with each of the initiatives that uh, the consumer is doing. So any thoughts? Mm -hmm. let, let me hear from the rest of the executive committee related to their thoughts. I, yeah, Octavio, I, I think um, it, would, it would help to clarify some of the, the, the areas that aren't clear for me. So I think for the research uh, groups, you know, we have, we have these committees, right? They, you know, um, one looking at acculturation, ethnicity, and I think mine was also tasked to, to look at um, peer, um, uh, peer recommendations. And then you have a committee which is really focused more on peer uh, recommendations. And I wasn't sure if that's just in the research or if it's you know for the full consortium, but I, I do see a, a nice role for that committee to be for the consortium and advise not just on research but on the other initiatives like TCHAT, CPAN, et cetera. So I would be supportive of that, and I think it would help clarify uh, some of. Do it on mute, Michael. <laughs> It would help clarify what the two different committees are doing. Uh, and I, I agree, maybe to clarify, the core group that Luann and I put together, and Luann, you can uh, sort of uh, talk to how we, we reached out on behalf of the executive committee to bring that peer and consumer voice first to the research committee. Uh, but I'm, I'm thinking just like you, Michael, that core group uh, really can, uh, I think, uh, I'd like to recommend to the executive committee in fact, it's not just for the research, but it's facts for you know C-SPAN, T-CHAT, as well as evaluation where, where we need to have that peer and consumer group, uh, our, our core committee group, uh, if it were created, uh, could be the, uh, 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 the avenue as well as uh, the ability to connect us to all the other networks you need in consumer and families across the state of Texas. Um, so just, uh, just to clarify, I think that's, that's what I'm recommending. I see um, Monica, you have a, um, some comments. I, I think this is a wonderful idea. My, my suggestion would also be a lot of us also locally, in fact, not just locally, but in our institutions, we have our own people with lived experience who advise us on a lot of things. So somehow liaison the central committee with that so that it, it has some sort of synergy may be worthwhile thinking about because like we have, peer groups uh, with lived experience, teens and early, young adults, they may have a different thinking than not somewhere. So maybe worth thinking about liaisoning with allowing for that. So, so well, I absolutely. Yeah, uh, I, I, that's exactly what I was thinking when I was referring to, it would be like a core committee that would interface and that's exactly correct because uh, you're, you're right, the, the value is at the, at the community level. Sorry, David. I, I see two hands. I'm going to, to Dr. Podolitz first and then Dr. Wakefield. Uh, I think it's a, a good idea to have consumer involvement in everything that we do, Octavio. Absolutely. My, I run into a couple of different uh, issues that I want to make sure that we're real clear on. And, and it's not to have the same group of people who participate uh, in the CPAN and T-CHAT because the, their ability to not blur the line between what we do in research is clearly a very demarcated place that CPAN and TCHAT do not enter. And so I'm, I, would, I would make sure we have that first established in our head. Second, I think that we've been working with the PTA Association uh, for the state of Texas. So I think out of that group should be our CPAN, TCHAT, uh, uh, probably advisory group, but I'd, I'd really try to keep those two groups separate and not have them be the same. 
um, and then down to the local level as we institute at our each institutions some particular project. And at that point, when we do the, the process through our own IRBs and get permission from our own universities, we have that next level of consumer engagement. Dr. Wakefield? Yeah, thanks. Um, I was gonna say something fairly similar um, to Dr. Potterwiltz that I think that they should be separate um, entities. And I also think that when you're looking at the clinical sphere um, that that would, I would like to hear what Dr. Williams has to say about integrating that into the function of the COSH. Um, not that it has to be totally uh, include, you know, include people only from Baylor and Central Operations Support Hub, but I think it would just create um, more synergy if um, there was a relationship there and the clinical activities and the cash and those goals, and then the separate um, group for the research committee, and that we're not just creating one high-level committee to look at everything um, that then isn't sh truly integrated into these programs. So, so how about this, Octavio, and, 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 uh, and the executive committee? Um, yeah, I know Luann has had some conversations with Andy and others related to what some opportunities to have people with lived experience in uh, advising us would be. How about we um, not vote today? Because I always think it's, you know, we, we need to make sure that we've really thought through things, how things are going to work have Luann work with you and, and a couple of other folks to put down on paper really what that role is, uh, what the structure is, how it interacts with everything, with, with all the different groups, and, and have that as a document that we come back to um, the executive committee at the next meeting, if they can do it, or the subsequent meeting. And um, so they've thought through all the kind of ins and outs and how to address the various e issues and flush that out. So we're not flushing out those issues during an executive committee meeting uh, and then come back to the, the whole consortium and uh, get your approval or direction on that. Octavia, does that sound reasonable? Yeah, I think it sounds great. And some folks brought up some really excellent points I hadn't even thought of myself, but I think that sounds like a good way to uh, to make it move forward, David, and I greatly appreciate uh, my colleagues in the executive committee for the discussion today. I, I think this is really important for us. Thank you. But Lu Luann, does that sound reasonable th th for you? Today, yes, I'd really, I'd I'll really you. love to hear who would like to be involved in that. Um, as Dr. Lakey mentioned, Andy Keller and I had a conversation about this as well. Um, so. I would, if you guys could let me know, uh, it looks like Dr. Martinez, you are interested. Is there, are there others? Andy, I, I feel like, uh, Dr. Trevetti, okay. So if, if you all could just send me a quick email or, um, and just say, you know, hey, I wanna be involved in this. I will be sure to call together the group and have a conversation and figure this out. So I think this is very exciting. I, I like, yeah. thank you. Well, and just I'm nominating more. myself also, Luann, please. For, I'm sorry? I'm nominating myself for that task. Okay. I did want to make one more comment um, that when we were instituting our work groups that we thought very, very um, diligently about this. And so for, if you remember for TeachAt and for CPAN, we talked about who the end user was, who the consumer was. Um, and so we have, uh, from NAMI, we have identified um, you know, parents and children who have, have helped us on the TCHAC committee, in addition to Education Service Center representation and TEA. So we already have a lot of great representation that I think it would be a loss if we did not reach back out to them because they were identified early on um, by people across our state as good um, representatives for an initiative like this. And now I think it's time to just put those people and additional people, if it makes sense, into a more centralized um, and collaborative uh, group. Yeah. I think that's a good point. From, from the very beginning, we've tried to make sure that that lived experience was involved in development of TCHAT, CPAN, and the, the other groups. And, and we'll have a discussion later today related to the future of those different work groups, but there, everything is moving forward and changing in some ways related to those roles. And so let us um, get your names, let's take this idea, let's uh, figure out how do we maybe consolidate that and um, 
be careful in defining the roles, responsibilities, et cetera, uh, of that. And so we're, we're very clear um, when we come together related to what that role is, okay? All right, very good. So let's go on then to item number six and the update on the, the COSH, uh, the Centralized Operating Support Hub, Dr. Williams. Hello, um, how's everybody doing? Hopefully well. I, I got a message last time that there were too many kitties. So um, I decided we'd start with a nice puppy. And I was also learning about deep breathing this morning and how to help with anxiety. And it's about the extended breath helps the parasympathetic nervous system. And also petting something really helps you calm down. So um, Jennifer and I have been steadily working on things. Um, we had plans and then we had 2020 hit us. And so everybody is aware that we're adjusting our plans. I don't know if anybody's watched the never ending story, but it does feel like it's a little bit never ending. So we'll go ahead and move on to the next slide. Um, for those of you who like kitties. Um, so we're gonna talk about telecommunications, um, data management, CPAN and T-Chat, and then the statewide referral system for everybody. Um, so I think one of the things that we're, we're just sort of working through is that there are lots of things that need to kind of happen a little bit simultaneously, some things in parallel. Um, and so we are steadily, hopefully working through things um, in an organized fashion to get us to where we wanna be. Next slide. So as you're all aware, we have the line up and running. It works. We are literally, I can't express the excitement, but also kind of like frustration. We're really at the exact last step for the contract being signed. I was hoping to be able to tell you this morning that it was signed. It's not quite there, but um, I'm hoping that it will be in the next uh, day or two. We have the interim triage system that is working. So how that works is that the phone number rings to Baylor and then we have a system with all the HRIs that are stood up that we send it to an internal number there so that that team member can get their calls um, as they come in. Lantana actually has assigned their project manager who is himself ready to go. Um, when, I speak, when I spoke with Lantana last, this past Friday as for an update, um, their goals are to um, have the contract signed, obviously, then meet with our team briefly to make sure that we run through exactly what they need to build. Then they are going to be contacting each of the HRI's teams. So I would like for the CPAN team lead at each HRI, as well as your telecommunications leadership um, team member to have that meeting. So the project manager is going to meet with each HRI because everybody understands that everybody has a slightly different system. I'm not a telecommunications um, expert. And so Leighton, the, the, the project manager will meet, discuss what is your needs, how much hardware, software you're going to, um, going to need to get. Um, the hardware will be purchased through the HRI budget, but everything else about Lantana will run through the COSH budget. Um, so once the hardware is built, you will not be getting bills from Lantana because Kosh will be managing that. Um, they will purchase and then come to your places and install and then also have meetings with the each HR team to make sure that you understand how to use all the functionalities that Lantana has. Um, they have a lot of built-in capabilities. Um, I think that you should have gotten an attachment that, sh that discusses all their different um, abilities. I'm not going to discuss them with you guys today. Um, but there are a lot of really good functionalities to help teams communicate with each other in, even in between calls um, and also for us to track all that data uh, as well. Um, so I know people are anxious for it, but we're, we're pretty close. Data management. Um, so we have been working through getting the BAA. Um, we were very thankful to Lachelle. She's been um, a rock star helping us navigate this along with Luann. Um, we have our compliance team at Baylor has worked very closely with the UT um, lead compliance, Christina. She, um, Millie and her met, hammered out sort of the larger agreement that hopefully all of the UT teams um, are going to be able to sign on um, as that master agreement. We've now had, I think with most of the HRIs that are not UT system related, we've had those 
communications between their compliance team and our team back and forth. So I think we're pretty close on getting um, the BAAs in uh, before the end of the month, which I'm excited about. Um, within that, um, I did send out a reminder last Friday. So for the executive committee members, particularly the chairs, um, just for you to have that on your radar that we're working through these processes. Um, the trade team, we have daily calls with the trade team. They are working through that first piece of their project. Um, we now have PCP enrollment here at Baylor through the trait um, um, application. Once the all the HRIs that have NDA signed should be getting an email from the trait team today, um, allowing for your team as your team agrees to it. Um, as far as your your team want, um, is able to say yes, you can start using the PCP enrollment part of trait. It does not have any health protected information. It's simply the enrollment piece of trait. Um, and but we can't do the second step of the trait um, until everybody has BAA signed. But we're anxious and happy to send out um, the trait app and program to those HRIs with NDAs. There's a few NDAs still circling, and we again send out a reminder about that as well. Um, until again, the, the the backup has been the red the red cap enrollment form until um, and also just using the form for the phone call until the rest of the forms are complete. Um, and then, like I said, Lachelle Luann um, has been having weekly calls with Jennifer and myself, which have been very helpful to keep us all on track. Next slide. So we have been working also here at Baylor to get the contract um, for trait. Um, obviously, that needs to get done. Um, we're in the, I want to say, the beginning to middle phase of working through that contract. The estimated time that we think it's going to take to get that fully completed is still another uh, month to two, um, but we're working as quickly as we can. We had a meeting with the um, IT teams and compliance teams across all the HRIs on May 26th. That was trade came and actually explained their data platform, the security elements, um, a lot of technical information. It did feel like they were speaking a language I, I didn't understand, but um, we had that meeting was recorded. So any team member that wasn't able to see it and needs to see it, we have that available and we've sent it out a few times to a few team members. And we're following up with, with every HRI that needs to meet with us um, individually. And then also Lachelle um, and Luann had organized for the UT system IT team to be doing a review and they are nearing that completion of their review of the platform. Next slide. Um, we did, um, the last time we talked about this, we had the data governance first meeting and we elected a chair and vice chair from the executive committee along with the team members. However, um, you know, exciting for Daniel, but unfortunate for us, um, just as we got him in, he pulled, he got pulled to do something else. So today I did want to bring up that uh, Dr. Plisco was um, very excited that it was going to be a co-chair process. So I'm assuming and imagining that he would also want it to continue to be co-chaired. Um, so we might need to have a discussion today, if but maybe not because it wasn't on the agenda, but um, we need to find a new uh, co-chair for the data management team. And I it also is on didn't the want agenda. To have... Dr. Williams, oh. it's on the agenda. Okay. I can't remember. And then also we wanted to consider adding um, some of the team members, uh, Molly and Tracy, um, to kind of help with that. So I'm going to stop right here for a second. Um, and I also saw a chat, but I, I didn't read it because I was reading my slides. Hey, Laurel, I think the last time um, this was brought up, there were a couple of folks who were on the EC who were expressed interest in joining this uh, governance committee as well. And I remember Michael uh, Patriarca as well, someone else uh, was asking to be involved. And so we want to be able to include them as well as team members. Yeah, yeah. I, think, I think Michael is, is on, so he can speak for himself. So apologize if I spoke out of school for you, Mike. Yeah, Alex, thank you. Yeah, that, that was uh, right. I did volunteer myself last time around, so I'm still interested. Tag, you're it. Um, I'll make sure you get added. Would you thank like you. to be the chair? <laughs> Well, you know, I mean, I'll volunteer my time if no one else 
raise their hand to be co-chair with uh, Steve. Well, why don't we, um, instead of making a designation right here, kind of off the cuff, um, if there are people that are interested in being the chair, uh, let Laurel know and come, let's come to the next meeting with Laurel, kind of that, again, thinking through who, who I, I think the people that have been mentioned would do a great job. I just, again, want to make sure that we do it in a, uh, an organized, transparent way. And so if, if folks are interested in being involved in the committee or being the, the chair of the committee, talk to Laurel and then uh, have those discussions, Laurel, and, and then bring that to us at the next meeting. Okay, I can, I can do that. Um, but as far as the adding of people separate from the chair, mm -hmm. um, would people be okay with the suggestions beyond Michael, which we should have already been added, but for potentially um, the Molly and Tracy to be considered to be added to the team, or that's something to discuss next time as well. I, I think you can go ahead and add them to, to, to it. Um, I, I just want to be careful with naming a chair. Um, we'll want to make sure that everyone that's involved has a, a, a chance to, to say we're interested and then that you have that conversation and then come back to the next meeting. And, and I know it's on the, the agenda to designate. I just want to make that's sure fine. we do that in a, in, a, in a fully logical process, okay? Yep, that makes perfect sense. So Alex, we can chat out, chat out line and then anybody else who's interested, please call me. Uh, let me know, we're, we're certainly looking for um, some additional team members, so I appreciate that. Next slide. So as you can see up at the top right, we actually have uh, a rendering that Daniel's team did for us um, for a magnet. Um, so we were looking for different ways to do communication um, as we start to enroll practices. Um, and so we thought a magnet that could easily stick up on, you know, the various metal file drawers we all seem to have in our various offices. So I think it's really nice. We haven't purchased anything yet. We're still in the planning stage, but I think we're really happy with this. We had a few other ideas with stickers and um, mouse pads as well, but I thought this was a really nice uh, representation of the new logo. For progress to date, we have um, over 900 um, people who've enrolled across the state of Texas, um, 106 practices. Um, we have about three to five calls per day, um, so and they're across the state, so it's not focused in just one area of Texas. We are getting them across the state. Um, we actually now have repeat callers. We have primary care doctors who've called more than once um, because they were so pleased the first time they wanted to call back. So um, we're happy to find that our customers to date are excited to hear about it. Um, we are working, uh, part of the COSH was to have a PCP consultant. Um, speaking of the end user um, that we just, conversation we just uh, were talking about with, with families and patients, um, the end user in, in, in the most obvious sense for CPAN is the PCP. So Dr. Tran um, is going to be that individual for us. She's now been on, involved with our daily calls a couple times a week. She's been helping us think through the communication strategies and processes that we want to um, get the, the PCPs across the state excited. She's been really great with that. We're working on the customer satisfaction survey that is part of our metrics. We've been including also Molly and Tracy in that conversation so that as we land on a survey um, that, we, um, that they are also helping us inform that process of the, of the questions that we wanna ask. Um, so we're, we're pretty close to having that complete. And once we have a complete survey, what we're going to do right now survey-wise is we're going to send out a survey link after somebody's um, called us to ask for help. Um, and then we're probably going to move also to like an annual survey um, or maybe quarterly that gets blasted out all at once to get you know feedback kind of all at once. But right now, we're very um, interested in knowing right now how people are feeling about the survey service. So we're trying to send it out. We're, want, we're going to want to send it out pretty soon after that call to help them kind of think through, was that call helpful or not helpful from their perspective? 
Um, as I said, we are working on different strategies to communicate um, CPAN out to out to the PCPs across Texas. Um, Dr. Tran and I, um, with T with the T Texas Department of uh, TPS, T Texas Pediatric Society, we're talking about a video presentation where we could have both Dr. Tran representing PCPs who are being who are using the service, and potentially myself or others presenting a, a brief um, video that we could um, have blasted out in various ways um, to the um, end user. We've also um, had a preliminary discussion with, um, with Dr. Lakey's team about using social media. Um, we are working through that process that what, what are Baylor's policies and procedures. We're going to um, give that information back to Dr. Lakey's team so they can look through everything. But we know that there is a number of Facebook page groups across Texas with different types of um, physicians nurse practitioners, PAs, as well as LinkedIn. And we think that'll be another way for us to kind of get the message out about um, CPAN. So we're going to be working on that. We also are possibly going to be having a contract, like I said, with Texas Pediatric Society. Um, most of the societies are very um, appropriately don't want to give out their email list to people, um, but we want to be able to potentially email um, providers with um, associating with somebody that they trust. Um, so they may open actually open the email and look at it. Um, so we're walking we're working through a contract with TPS where they would help send out information about CPAN through their newsletter, as well as if we have things like a video link that they could send out to providers um, about CPAN. Um, so we're going to do that not just with the Pediatric Society, but also I have a meeting this week with the Family Practice Society as well, and then we'll be reaching out to the NP and PA state associations too. Um, we're also talking with the large insurance um, company uh, teams across Texas. Um, we've met with two different ones to date, um, Aetna and uh, Texas Children Health Care Plan. They're both over the moon excited that they could potentially be able to share this information with their primary care providers and their networks. So we're actually hoping to utilize some of their communication and marketing strategies to get the word out about CPAN. And then we have another meeting that Dr. Lakey and myself are doing um, on July 27th again to kind of get the word out. So hopefully get a partner with a number of different teams and not just sort of try to do it all ourselves when it comes to getting the word out about CPAN. I can tell you that when we actually reach a PCP on the phone to enroll when we're doing our cold calls, if they actually pick up the phone and talk to us, they are over the moon excited about the, pro the product and want to enroll. Um, so we really are just looking at how we can make sure we get to the primary care doctor or the provider because um, that's where we know that we're going to build those relationships and get people to enroll. We also have individual monthly meetings with each CPAN HRI to help them think through their strategies and help them kind of just process um, issues that are specific to their team. But we're also going to have scheduled monthly statewide meetings with the larger CPAN team to kind of really help have synergy and continue our great collaboration across the state. So um, I talked with Dan about the CPAN website. Um, his team is poised and ready to help build out the website um, that consortium already has for, uh, for the initiative. One thing that we do want to talk about is the idea about how to have a portal so that a PCP could just go to a website and enroll without even having to talk to somebody. So that's where the connection with Dan's team that he's going to hire and trade will need to come together because there's some web logic um, coding that has to be built so that it could be built. Um, but we're in those discussions right now. Um, the COSH has looked over um, CPANs across the country, have looked at their websites, and we really do keep coming back to, I know we talked about this quite a bit, but McPAP really does have the the, the website that is the website to emulate, not copy, but emulate. Um, and so we're going to be working on that as a as a preview, because I haven't said this to the CPAN teams yet, but you executive committee members get to hear things first, yay. Um, we are going to start doing a sprint to start developing the content for the website. Um, so what I'm going to try to do is in the next uh, – few weeks, we're going to ask for all the teams across the state, so this is not just Baylor-driven, because we know we have experts across our state. We're going to have um, um, each going to have a small team where they're going to take one of these um, pieces of the first web page 
um, and ask them to still work on developing the content for that page, bring that back to the larger CPAN group, and then um, sort of, but, and this is where I have a discussion point, Dr. Lakey, at that point, do we want the whole executive committee to vet it, or do we say the CPAN statewide group is sufficient and then we can hand it over to Daniel's team to put um, on the website that he's building? I, I think uh, it, um, that that work group's pretty large, isn't it? I mean, it has good representations of this executive committee. Um, it doesn't have a quorum, but has a large representation. I, I think, um, and I'll let the executive committee members, um, you know, if you have a different uh, opinion, but if you come with a strong recommendation, um, why don't we, we'll inform the, the, the group, but, but probably don't need to have a vote on the group. I, I think probably inform, you know, if anybody has a strong feeling uh, that, that we can, uh, after you present it, then we can adjust. But um, I, I think we need to go ahead and start moving forward on it. When, when, when do you think that'll be ready? So I would anticipate that I would like to have the information ready by the um, August meeting mm -hmm. so that, so we would have the, the first front page that we need to have. So all the content for the front page, including possibly a, a video, because we know sometimes people want to click on video. Some people want to read. Um, and then we want to have the three breakout pages that we know will be the highest yield, which is ADHD, anxiety, depression. Um, because those are, and then potentially a COVID resource page. Um, so uh, I would like for us to develop those teams, get them working on it and have that information um, available because Dan's team, I, I, as, I, as I spoke to him about what his process is going to be for web, I think that we are sort of like, we get to like August um, and we would be aligned, then his team would be able to start putting the content up. I, I think the, why don't you come back and share that information, but I, I think we need to move it forward um, and, uh, yeah, okay. just just keep the executive committee in tune so, so that they, they know what's what's going on and can make adjustments. Alan, did, did you have a, a uh, your hands raised? Did you have a, another comment? Yes, I, I just, you know, I want to really empower our, our uh, focus groups to do the work that this council has asked them to do. Mm -hmm. So I think, you know, to support, you know, Laurel and, and what's happening is that one of the things that I've struggled with probably over the last nine months is how we as a consortium really begin to speak the same language. And, and I, 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 I trust our T-Chat, our CPAN, our workforce group to really begin to shape our language. And, and if I would say we need to go forward if there are particular issues that we say we need to have changed, then we can change them. But what I found is that to wait for another meeting before we actually move forward is keeping us from, many of us, from the place where we need to be because we're, we're building our own. I'm cutting and pasting logos onto to items and documents and, and we can't wait to get real material, training material to our, our primary care folk in the field. We, we need to be able to provide it to them because that's yet another resource. I think the call itself is great, but when we could actually hand them a resource that helps walk them through how to do ADHD, how to do depression, how to do you know, timeouts during the time of COVID, COVID is something they can use not in a month or two months or all the way to August, but literally today. So I just wanna empower what you know, Laurel, that I, I would hope that we just let you go forward, create, and I'll, I'll play however you want me to play. You know that, so that's it. No, I appreciate it. Uh, Octavio, your hand's raised. Laurel, uh, this is just a quick comment on uh, when you were back on the uh, uh, the marketing component. Um, just a thought to think about uh, in marketing uh, is uh, getting these materials and, and reaching out to the network of health foundations that are across the state of Texas. So I mean, there's Methodist Code in San Antonio, Episcopal Health Foundation in Houston, Meadows, of course, hogs centrally across the whole state. But anyway, just a thought. Yes, uh, I will definitely uh, Dan, add that. Uh, Daniel knows, um, you know, probably most of those communications folks, but it could be an additional way to get the word 
Yeah. Might be mostly. Yeah. Okay. Very good. I mean, I think um, for I, 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 there's a tension because you know we we keep going back to how long it will take to stand up, and I think that um, that was my kitty um, slide at the beginning. Like we kind of everyone every everybody needs everything now, um, and we definitely have that pressure. But I and so I appreciate that we're allowed to move forward, but. I just wanted to um, bring it up just in case um, we were moving too quick, but we would like to have the content ready in August and that sort of aligns with when um, Daniel feels like his team potentially to start putting it on the page. No, I, I agree with Alan. Let's, let's move forward, keep the okay. executive committee informed and we can tweak things based on input, but um, okay. let's get it set up and moved. Great. We will. All right. Anything else? Okay. Um, next page. So I did want to update the team today about T-Chat. Um, there's also an Excel spreadsheet because obviously this is very hard to read. Um, we did a survey with the HRIs about um, how they are pulling together their T-Chat teams. Um, we, we had uh, pretty much all the teams respond. Um, as you can see, I'm not going to go through this in super detail, but one of the things I, I wanted to see for myself as the person kind of helping organizing is how are teams really themselves organized and how are they functioning, what's different, what's not about them. I'm pleased to say that in actuality, most teams are, are operating relatively in a similar way. Um, there's, there's a few teams that are doing things a little bit different, but relatively similar. Um, and so the structure of, of sort of how things are operating, I think there actually may be a lot of abilities for us to, I wouldn't want to say completely standardize what we're doing with T-Chat, but get closer to that than um, we had all maybe initially thought. Um, there, most of the, the HRIs that are um, having school districts, I didn't want to, again, put, a, put this on a slide because the, uh, several of this um, HRIs have more than 30 schools within the ISCs that they're going to be coordinating with. I know the TEA would like this information. I am trying to get it organized in a way that we can hand it over to them. Um, but again, there is, I uh, just want to point out that most of the teams are kind of um, developing along a very similar line of how they're organized. Okay. Dr. Newland had a question and then Dr. Wagner, I, just, I see she just raised her hand. Okay. I can stop right there. Dr. Newland. Not, not so much a question as it is, and this is kind of a suggestion about the CPAN and getting the word out and engaging pediatricians. And I don't know if you want to talk about it now or save it for the CPAN work group. Um, but so up to you. I don't want to sure, sure. impede your flow. Uh, uh, it's, it's okay. You can tell me now. So I was I was working on you know we were going to use Project Echo to engage our pediatricians and family doctors. And um, in talking with some other folks who do Project Echo, I learned that um, one of the key ways they've been able to engage primary care providers is with maintenance of certification as part of their CME. Yeah. And part of their uh, maintenance of certification is quality improvement um, and getting them qualified for mock. Because, you know, the, um, their professional organization for PEDS um, has a one, like a wonderful cache of materials ready-made so this is you know we don't want to reinvent the wheel for peds or for family medicine um but offering the mock is probably a good way to get them engaged on an echo so if everyone who wants to do something like a, an echo um either collectively or separately because i think you know with echoes you're going to be more effective if you have your region as your echo but we share materials collectively sure right? Okay. Yeah. Um, but the problem will be finding who will be the organization to provide the CMEs because I've found that at least like BCM is our crediting organization for CMEs does not offer mock. Okay. And I don't know who in the consortium does offer mock. Okay. I, I'll definitely track it down. I don't I agree. I mean, everybody nowadays has to be consumed with MOC, so that's not a bad strategy. So, okay, I'll look, I'll look into it, and then we'll work on it. Yeah. Laurel, 
uh, yes. the, at uh, UNT, we have an organization called PACE. And P PACE has been doing these uh, trainings literally nationwide for probably the last 15 years. Um, and so they would probably be a really good resource because they, they're able to do mock for lots of different things. I mean, they've got, okay. it, you know, for psychiatry, they've got it for internal medicine, they got it for, you know, uh, pediatricians. Uh, so they've, they've been in this arena for quite some time. So they may be just a touch point to say, sure. how do we make that happen? Okay. Yeah. Qualifying for mock is not hard. Just doing the echo qualifies you for mock for peds. It's and and training and maintenance of training and echo is basically free. And you can do it virtually through MD Anderson. And I have the contact info if anybody wants to do a training to become eligible to, to provide the echo. And that's not hard. And um, and we also have partners out there, nonprofits, since we were talking about that earlier, that would like to help promote Project Echoes to primary care providers. Um, but the hard part is just finding, you know, when you go to provide the CMEs, which doesn't cost very much, it's a couple thousand dollars, is finding one that not only knows how to certify you as a CME provider, but also a CME for mock, which is the next step. Okay. I, I again, it sounds like I need to talk more with Alan about PACE and then I, as far as looking at the ins and outs of CME, because um, I agree people may more, maybe more likely to click if they're not just going to get mock but also CME. Okay, Dr. Wagner. Just to update your T-chat update at UTMB in Galveston, we, we are enrolling students at, at two um, independent school districts. Good. Okay, I will add that. Thanks. And fix that slide for the minutes if we can. Very good. Thank so, um, other I don't I actually don't see the hands. Anybody else before I move? Sarah Wakefield has her hand up. Hey, Sarah. Hey, um, I also wanted to say, just piggybacking on what Dr. Newland said, um, that we could probably also reach out to UNM. Um, they might have some good ideas about how to certify for CME and, and MOC. Um, we're also an echo certified institution <laughs> and, and have uh, really great contacts over there. So happy to help facilitate that as we're using echo as part of our program currently and have a curriculum, but we have not done the MOC part because um, we've been doing it directly with schools, not to PCPs. Um, but I think that's a fantastic idea. Cool. All right. Sounds good. Thank you. Next slide. So um, when we were looking at also how much was personnel um, were at the school, not just what we were doing at our HRI, again, it was pretty, um, it was pretty consistent that most people are using school personnel as unpaid but liaisons that, they'll, that the HR is going to collaborate with. Um, so there was a few teams that were hoping to collaborate with some nurses, um, as well as most teams were hoping to collaborate with counselors, but that we were not in the process of um, paying uh, school team members, but um, work, work to say collaborate with them. Next slide. Um, so again, there, uh, most of the refer referral process right now is coming in through a form that's been created. One of the things I'm, we're trying to do is see if we can standardize the form um, with some abilities for as as Dan did with some slight customization per team, but is there a way for us to formalize and standardize? Um, a, a few teams are using a web process here at Baylor. We're actually using a, an email that we, an email account that we created. Um, so again, there's pretty standard how this is happening. There's a little bit of um, not standardization about who is scheduling the appointment. Um, although it does lean towards mostly the HRIs doing the scheduling, not the school. Um, but the, there are a few locations where they're having the school um, team members themselves schedule the appointments. I think as we move through COVID and figuring out how much the kids are at school versus at home, I, I feel like that piece can also be, um, may need to change because one of the reasons why we pivoted, well, we had always have been, we're having the, our, our team do it, but particularly if the kids are not on campus, it starts to make less sense that the, the, the school would be the one scheduling the appointment. But generally speaking, um, it's a little bit more towards that the, the HRI themselves is scheduling the appointment. Next slide. 
Um, as we talk about how we can sort of look at the outcomes and uh, of the young people themselves, this slide also is just looking at what are team members themselves already pre prepared to do from a uh, measurement-based care that's normal to, um, pr to providing care. And again, we have actually a fair amount of synergy of what um, sorts of measures people are already using in their care or we're planning to use for TeachChat. We're actually having a meeting this Friday with the TeachChat teams to kind of discuss across the state, um, can we land on a set of, of measures that we all are agreeing that we'd want to use? And so um, we will be able to say more about that next time, but I was encouraged to see that uh, generally speaking, there's already a fair amount of agreement. Um, so I think that it hopefully won't take that much effort for TeachChat to have um, a set of measures that we're saying that we're going to look at, you know, as the young people come in and as we provide the care for them. Um, again, for the how we're actually going to get the kids in for appointments, again, the, the vast majority of people are doing a coordination triage from the, from the HRI side um, where they're reaching out and scheduling the appointments. Um, a few teams are having an additional step of having a team meeting before the patient is scheduled, um, but that more teams are basically getting the information from the school, calling the family, getting a little bit more information from the family, and then based on their algorithm, sending them for an appointment to the right team member in their HRI. Um, so, and several of the teams are, are able to do a same-day appointment for for cases that um, uh, meet the criteria for urgency. Others um, are sort of saying within three days. I always say within three days, but also based on what the family wants, what family preferences, because sometimes we may want to do in three days, but they say, how about next week? Um, the vast majority of them are also using a language line that they already have through their affiliate or HRI. A few teams are looking at purchasing or getting a, a a telecommunications, a video conferencing platform that actually has a language line embedded in it. Um, but again, everybody is prepared to provide the services to families that, regardless of the language that they, uh, the family is comfortable speaking. Laurel, a Andy Keller has a question for you, on, I think on the last slide. Oh, okay, sorry. I, yeah, I can't see yeah. that, that piece. No, 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 no problem. Go ahead, it's Andy. Okay, Laurel, no problem. Just want to talk about um, the metric, the measures, and I, it's great the process you're going through on that, but I think it's really important that you that the two research network leads and the clinical leads be involved in that discussion. So if there's a chance, a choice between you know one data thing that's slightly different from another, you know one screen that's slightly different from one that's being used in the uh, um, trauma network, that you know we just make a conscious decision about that because we should have as much alignment on standard protocols as possible. Even though there's a firewall between the research piece and T chat for program evaluation and program oversight, making sure that we're looking, using the same instruments. Um, I think it's critical and I'm sure you all thought about that, but I just wanted to make sure that was on the record and people were prioritizing that. Thank you. I don't, I think that sounds reasonable. Um, I, say, I haven't, I, I don't know, but other people have other questions. <laughs> I just wanted to say one thing about the uh, Vanderbilt versus the SNAP4. So I know most people use uh, the Vanderbilt, but um, it's really supposed to be used only until age 12. But the SNAP4 is just as short. It's open um, to the public for clinical and research. And it's, it's very, very similar, but it's been val validated up to 18. And since right. we're doing, and you know, I never even noticed that the Vanderbilt was really supposed to, that most of the research on it is on ages six to 12. But uh, so we might, just something to think about when schools are, I mean, when, when you all are deciding which one to use, if you're doing high school students, you probably should be using SNAP4. Thank you. Well, there's I another that. point about which is gonna be most um, uh, sensitive to treatment related change. And that's where there are very few trials that actually involve the Vanderbilt. It's not that wieldy for serial administration. So as Sarah says, something like the SNAP4 would be uh, probably a little more suitable for that purpose where it's been used numerous times or the ADHD rating scale or, or whatever. Okay. Well, it sounds like that um, 
you know, working to make sure that whatever measures may be um, already decided or just in discussion for research as well as um, to, to take that point with the SNAP. Again, that the meeting that we're having is, is going to involve all the HRIs, the teams, the, the team leads for TCHAT at each of your institutions. Um, because again, we want to hear input from all the teams because we are hoping to drive towards a shared set of measures that we would say we're doing for TCHAT. Um, so I think all of these comments are very helpful. And it's not to say that team members can't do additional things. So if your HRI really feels very, it's very important to do a specific measure, um, again, we're not to say not to do that. It's more, can you also then add this when you're doing TCHAT visits specifically? Next slide. Um, and next slide. So uh, the final thing that we are working on that across that crosses both um, CPAN and TCHAT is a referral system. Um, so Jennifer Evans, who uh, has been helping me with this work um, as the program administrator, she has the most of the information here. But we are working to um, with each of the HRIs. We will be asking for you to help us get loaded in the, the referrals that you system that you currently have and the teams that you currently use into this um, this other system called WellNetty. Um, it's a provider only database, so it's not that a family member can call it can query WellNetty. It's it's provider uh, to provider. Um, and again the goal is to get as as much as the, the more that we can get all the various teams that provide mental health services across the state of Texas to participate. The, the, the more informed the system can be. It has ways and processes that it helps keep the information up to date so that you're not sending out out-of-date referrals. Um, but we also are working to, to work how we can collaborate and coordinate with 211 uh, as well. So that's another process that we're working on is to get the statewide referral system up and running. And um, Courtney uh, Seals has been very instrumental in helping Jennifer um, and myself as we're working through this process and project. Laurel, uh, would you happen to know if uh, um, tracking what third party payers a particular um, site might accept is tracked in well in wellnity? Uh, uh, we are going to ask providers to say what in what per part um, what insurers you take. Is that what you mean, Joe? Yeah. Okay. Yes, we are going to be asking that. We've actually had a, a separate conversation with some of the um, managed care organizations that want to know, can you maybe help us get connected with providers who are not taking our insurance but might be interested in taking our insurance, um, you know, and in providing, you know, um, care? So we've actually had a conversation that is there a way for us to have some synergy there? Yeah. And then I see there's another question from somebody. So question. I had to have a Star Wars in here somewhere. So if, if that is my question, I just have a quick question for TCHAT and probably same will apply to CPAN. In terms of the menu or battery of measurements you are using or recommending for <clears throat> people to use to monitor outcomes, have you settled on, because in depression, anxiety especially, I think using some kind of at least standardized measurement tools would be helpful to monitor longer term outcomes or even in the short term. So that's, again, that's partly what our conversation is on Friday with the TCHAT teams is to talk about that. And so I think, you know, your and Andy's input about what's, what's already going on within the research team would be of use to, to I would like to know, because I don't know that I know yet. Any other questions for Laurel about the cost? Liz. Elizabeth? So um, I had some discussions about measurement with, um, with school personnel because, I mean, I certainly think it's very helpful to have, um, to have all of these measurements done, especially before your clinicians even maybe um, meet with the kiddo. And it's wonderful to be able to, tr to track them in terms of outcomes. But logistically, if these are emergent cases, if these are kids who are, you know, having behavioral dysregulation that's fairly significant, or if these are kids who have made inflammatory statements, 
asking them in the moment or soon after the moment uh, to complete a battery of measures, I, I guess I was thinking in my mind, we need to be very selective and pick very short measures, um, at least until the crisis has been addressed. Um, so I'm just gonna put that out there and ask like how, how mindful do we need to be about how much we're asking them to fill out? I mean, I really focused on, you know, um, how, like how suicidal are they? Is this a kid with, you know, what we're asking them to send us kids who are really in crisis because of either being, you know, suicidal, homicidal, something to do with psychosis or a behavioral, you know, issue that's more an externalizing disorder. So versus, okay. you know, sort of more ongoing issues that are gonna need treatment. I do think that we want to balance um, being, being intrusive and, and asking for too many things. That's one of the reasons why I wanted to talk as a group. Are, are there some ways that we can land upon a shared model? Um, and so I think you can certainly add that in. Do we do something slightly different when it's a same day urgent appointment versus a kid that's being scheduled next week? Um, because there, there is the ability from a lot of the T-Chat teams where they're not just doing everything is urgent, 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 same day by when I mean urgent, but that they are scheduling out a few days and that gives a family and the, the, the patient a, a, a time to complete some, some measures. Um, so I think that can be part of the conversation that we're having on Friday with the T-Chat uh, sort of team. So I'll bring it up for sure. Dr. Wakefield had a question. Okay. Yes. Um, yeah, thanks. I really just had two comments. One, I wanted to um, put in a plug for that little triage meeting. I know you said some teams were doing it, and it is how we have incorporated our trainees into this process more to help them understand like appropriate triage um, that I think is a really great learning experience that I don't want to be a missed opportunity for all of our HRIs. And we can talk about if anybody's interested in that, I'm happy to talk more about how we do that and how we facilitate that quickly. Um, the other part is that uh, we, I totally agree, we've been doing this for a long time and some of our kids are in crisis. I haven't had an issue um, with this. We have a standard set of measurements. Some of them just refuse to complete them, but they just refuse to complete them and then we do them later. Um, but most of the time they will complete all of them, whether we're seeing kids who are in crisis coming in from juvenile justice or from schools or things like that. And so I would say that we want to limit it to those things that are going to be helpful clinically as an assessment and triage tool. And then if you want to get additional things later, there can be additional measurements, um, but to not assume that kids won't fill them out because usually they will and their parents will as well. Okay, thank you. Ms. Wesley? Uh, thanks, Laurel, for all your work. We have truly had um, great success with uh, you getting back to us with questions and providing input. Uh, I also, am with Sarah, we would like to uh, be involved. We do a lot of case management with our program and um, haven't found any barriers or issues to the assessment tools being filled out but certainly our like Sarah's program in which we do a lot of triage and would love to have some opportunity to talk about that. Great. Well, um, tag your it. We're definitely, those are the conversations we're gonna start having with those sort of monthly T-chat meetings, team meetings. So that's the other thing I didn't mention, but we're having, a, it's just like CPAN is gonna have a monthly meeting. T-chat is also having both individual HR meetings as well as a, a monthly meeting that Generally speaking, does not include executive committee members, so we're 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 just doing the work as Alan suggested. We'll add you. Very good. Any other questions or comments? Well, thanks, Dr. Williams. A lot of work, a lot of progress, and uh, appreciate the work that your team is doing. So well, have so, fun. So a couple of quick housekeeping. Um, Dr. Thompson, uh, Peter, I see you're, you're here, so I just want to note that. And Alex Vo is here, noting that. And I don't think Sonia Gaines is here, but Stacy Silverman has joined us. So um, we're almost at, uh, we're just missing a couple of people from our executive committee. So it is a little after 12. Uh, we said that we would have a break for lunch. Uh, let's break and let's start back again at 12.30. Okay, so we'll keep the Zoom going, but I will resume the conversation at, at 12.30. Okay, thank you.
Uh, just so we don't pick people as extraneous, I'm going to mute everybody and so mute you, unmute yourself if you wish when we get back.
just a reminder that I did mute everybody, so people will need to be reminded to unmute themselves. Hello, everyone. We're going to start in about one minute. I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna do roll call again, just because uh, I can't see if certain people are here or not. Uh, and again, I need to make sure that I actually still have a quorum. So uh, let me start at the top of the list, Dr. Goodman. And you'll have to unmute your lines because we uh, everyone was muted during the break. Dr. Goodman. Okay. Uh, I know. Dr. I think he just stepped out for lunch. So, um, I'll check. Okay. Dr. Williams, uh, that's you, right? You're here. Present. Uh, <clears throat> Dr. Liberson? Israel? Okay. Dr. Harper? Present. Okay. Dr. Wakefield? Present. Dr. Liberson is here. Okay, great. Thanks. Uh, Dr. Trevino? I'm here. Okay. Dr. Thompson? I see you. Yep, I'm here. Uh, Dr. Martin? Here. Dr. Polowitz? Here. Dr. Chesse? Here. Dr. Nimroff? Here. Dr. Strakowski? Dr. Tan? Dr. Robert? Dr. Wagner? Here. Dr. Vo? I'm here. Dr. Suarez? I'm here. Great. Dr. Newland? Dr. Newland? Here. Dr. Plitska? Here. Okay. Dr. Blader? Joe? Here. Okay. Dr. Iskamila? Here. Okay. Mr. Patriarca? I'm here. Great. Dr. Matthews? Jeffrey Matthews? Here. Okay. Brittany Nichols? Here. Okay. Dr. Tominga? Carol? No. Dr. Ibrahim? Dr. Ibrahim, Sonny Gaines, Mike Maples, Stacy Silverman. Dr. I'm Silverman. here. Okay. Miss Wesley. Here. Great. Dr. Keller. Dr. Martinez. Here. Danette Castle? Here. Dr. Borges? Here. Okay.
So I have 25, uh, and I think the other members are going to join us in just a minute. So we, we have quorum, and we can go ahead and, and start. So we are now on item number seven, and which focuses on the current work groups. And so at the beginning of this journey of putting together the consortium way back in September, we established these uh, five work groups to, to get things going and, and in many ways to get us to where we could have a submittal to the LBB uh, and then once it was approved to move it forward and to get things going. You know, as I've noted in the last several meetings, wanted to bring this up and think through with you is, is the, the, the work groups that we put together at the beginning, are those still the work groups that we need? We had some discussion earlier today of wanting to put together another work group related to um, consumer uh, peer um, advocates uh, and, and get maybe start that work group. But wanted to think through, and I'll go one by one related to the, the current work groups that we put together. And, and that the basic question is, do we still need that work group or does the work of that group, now that we've gotten things started, really the discussions need to be at this level at the executive committee or, or not? So let, let's go ahead and get started. Um, well, let, let me start with you, the, um, with the and, and, and Dr. Wakefield for, for both of you as part of this on TChat and CPAN. We, we had the work groups and got things going. We now have the cost set up. Uh, we've had, we have a data advisory group that we're setting up for the cost. And, and again, they're the management of, of both those projects. Wanted to hear from both of you related to those initial work groups. Do we still need those for TChat and then for, for CPAN? Dr. Wakefield? Sure. So I actually am an advocate for um, redistributing, redistributing some of the members. Like we talked about earlier, we have some great end user members, lived experience, um, things like that. And so I think that that all of that is really important um, to the overall mission and the continuum. And I also think with um, Miss Wesley and um, myself and some of the other programs that have uh, some historical experience with programs like this, we can continue to provide some high level consultative um, uh, information with Dr. Vo's experience with telemedicine and all of that. Um, what I don't think that is necessary at this time is the uh, representation from more HRI level because that is going to be uh, included in those discussions with the COSH between the COSH and the HRIs. So as to not duplicate things and to integrate the good work that we've done, the great committee members that we have, um, all still being included, but in different kind of roles and pockets. Uh, yes, we're Alex, were you going to say something? Dr. Bo, were you going to say something? Okay. Dr. Wakefield, did you have anything else? No, I, I think that's, I mean, that was, um, Alex and I had talked about this and and um, I think we were both on the same page. We wanna be um, helpful, but we want our, our, um, our help to be collaborative and efficient and not to duplicate anything that the, the Kosh is doing. And so I would get many you know requests of when are we having another work group meeting? And often I was waiting on, okay, well, Kosh really needs to be involved in some of these decisions. They're already holding meetings with the TEA. Um, so I do think that our work group did a great job of getting us to the place where we are and facilitating those relationships with education service centers and the TEA um, and NAMI um, and many other organizations. Um, but I I think that the cost now is in that uh, central role to continue to facilitate that. Dr. Williams, do you have other thoughts about that? Um, I think that Sarah M and Sarah W we've, and Alex, I think we've all had these conversations, you know, at least for CPAN and T-Chat. And I do think that we've sort of landed on like, that idea of efficiency and, and is it time to retire but still bring in those team members that um, particularly 
are not necessarily sitting at an HRI, but we need to have presence such as NAMI, um, other, the TEA, um, so including those people. So I, I think that makes sense from my perspective. And then I think that's what I'm hearing from, but I also was wanted to make sure that Sarah and Alex did themselves sort of share their perspectives. Okay. Sarah, anything you want to add to that? Martin. Oh, no, I'm good. <laughs> okay. So, so I, I guess I want to make sure that so, I... This is Danette. Um, what is the mechanism then, and, and is there a mechanism um, for kind of getting representation from perhaps local mental health authorities that are actually are putting it on the ground? Um, is there a benefit to doing that? Um, or where could that fit? Since we want to be sure that we are addressing our referral challenges as they unfold, um, figuring out ways that we're um, you know, responding and, and focused in a way that we need to be from a local mental health authority perspective. So, so I, I think on the, these different groups, we, we'll have different solutions to that. And so, so I think these two groups, the CPAN and the TCHAT got us going, we have the cost. And I guess what I'm hearing from Sarah is, is that there may be some duplication there. And, and the cost has a data advisory group. Maybe we need to set up a, a different type of advisory group as a whole for, for the COSH and Danette, maybe that would be where things yeah. get plugged in. But instead of having a CPAN, a TCHAT, a COSH kind of consolidated into an overall kind of COSH advisory group. Dr. Yeah. Williams, what do you think? Yeah, so I, I think uh, as I, my last slide uh, for COSH update was about the, the referral system and the, ob the obvious um, needs for both CPAN and TCHAT to have um, a good understanding and linkage across the state for for all the different teams that provide mental health. So to me, one of the natural places for some of that work could be in a, a, a committee that's sort of that's what they're doing and working on um, and that they come in intermittently to T-Chat or CPAN to sort of talk about the work. But there's a lot of um, overlap with our needs to find, you know, kids care beyond CPAN beyond T-Chat. So I'm in full agreement with the recommendation to streamline and it's it's always important to step back and think about has the a particular work group or committee or whatever completed its work and is it ready to move to a different level uh, in terms of implementation and oversight and you know movement forward. So I fully agree with with that. I would just like to be sure that we have you know folks identified from the field who have good experience. Um, I mean, I can always be a part of that process as well to help facilitate getting the right people involved. Um, but, you know, from a Texas Council perspective, we're not the implement implementers of these things. So the most immediate and good feedback is going to come from folks from the field. Yeah, uh, can I say a few words? Uh, is there anybody else? Joe, Joe, we have a couple of hands raised, but Joe, Joe, why don't you go? And then after Joe, after you, I'll go to uh, uh, Dr. Polowitz, and then to Ms. Wesley. Yeah, thank you. Um, one concern that comes to mind is that, now remember the, the COSH uh, is, is a support hub. And I think we want to keep that separate from, from policy, you know? So, um, that, so I'm all for, then, you know, in the interest of efficiency, some, I don't know whether you want to call it an advice, advisory board sounds a little too arm's length, uh, but we don't want to necessarily have, have a whole lot of duplication. So some sort of body that is involved in policy and um, synthesizes the experience and ideas and um, you know procedural finesse of the people implementing the program and people and uh, other stakeholders I'm not sure what you would call that but something like an advisory uh, group I think would be the logical next step for um, the transformation of the current work groups okay dr. Polowitz well, we initially used the term work group and the work groups have done what they done needed to do and have gotten us started. 
So I think re taking another look at who's on those work groups right now and what they are. And advisory level is, for me, not necessarily at too far at arm's length, but, but the both CPAN and TCHAD are gonna have their groups of managers that will be actually at their hubs doing the work. And so both, both CPAN and TCHAT need to have some organization around those folks that they're gonna be working with every day. And it, because those are the people that will be working with the people that the net is talking about. They'll be out there, what are the, what are the you know, who are the people who wanna sign up for CPAN? How much of the availability do you have within the LMHA or another organization? for uh, the CPAN, for the T-CHAT. So there's lots of different models that will occur as we go through T-CHAT because different school districts have different methods. Fort Worth ISD, for example, has their family resource centers. So they refer everyone up through this family resource center. So it's not necessarily at an individual school. So this becomes a district-wide, where at another place, the only place you can start is at one individual school. And I think that's where the T-Chat folk need to be able to learn from each other. And then the, the, the consortium level folk are the ones who would be the advocates. So Joseph, Joseph maybe we can say the, the, the consortium advocates for CPAN, the consortium advocates for T-Chat, that there's a, a thought group that can support the, the, those two particular projects. Okay. Ms. Wesley, Danielle? So just echoing on what Joe and Alan have also said, I think some particular components of both of those work groups and COSH could be consolidated and streamlined. Where I want to be careful is that the thought leadership and the consultative nature of the existing programs, helping to support those that are standing up new programs, that that doesn't get lost, because I think there is um, as Alan mentioned, the, the, the thought leadership of, of how we do this across the state, um, looking at different models that work in respective communities uh, that perhaps may not work in one community. So I think that perhaps is not a data or a cost or a central management component, but I just wanna make sure that that is not lost in how we think about restructuring and reorganizing. Okay, that, that's what I was getting at, thank you. And, and I guess my, my other kind of kind of question to, to Joe, to you and uh, Ms. Wesley, and the, the executive committee will still be engaged and there can policy issues that come to us. But obviously we, we are, are very busy and, and we're doing a lot of budget issues, et cetera. And, and so I guess not trying to put uh, words in your mouth, but you'd still see even with an executive committee that's very involved and the cost very, very much implementing there need to be some type of policy group to, to look at how, um, with, with other people that are not in the executive committee, uh, advising how things need to move forward in the, in the future. I do to provide that um, input, oversight, you know, uh, get some, um, uh, a, a wider swath of brains involved in the very specific tasks that I think are, um, probably too um, nitty gritty for the executive committee at large. Okay. Laurel, any feedback from you? Yeah, I, I, I um, definitely take the, the, the approach that Kosh has been taking is that we are support to the teams. We are planning to bring all the teams together because we do think that we need to learn from each other and not just go about our business at each HRI kind of doing something, essentially recreating a wheel that doesn't need to be recreated. So I do think that some of that work is going to happen within the, those work of the teams that are getting themselves launched. But I very much take the point that two points. One, we need to potentially add a few more team members to those um, regular meetings to ensure that we don't lose the knowledge that was gained with the committees, particularly for T-Chat. Second, it is possible that it's very useful to have another set of eyes um, looking. And so that's why I wonder, go back to that sort of issue, are there some larger themes that need to be pulled out that become a committee 
such as, again, particularly for, I just keep going back to referrals because they're going to be a problem or a, a challenge both for CPAN and TCHAT. How do we organize that across the state, um, knowing that we have individual all the way down to particular ISD issues, but also like lens. So I, I do think that there could be value in something that's not just the TCHAT and CPAN work groups themselves that are being formed for through COSH, but something that's not the just the executive committee. Okay. So, so, so how about if we do this uh, for, for these two groups? Uh, Laurel, if, if you'd work with Luann and let's figure out then kind of what that structure would look like. Uh, it, it sounds like there may be some duplication, but there's obviously the, the what we heard, the, the value of the, the policy component. And let's think through uh, with you and Luann and, and uh, if somebody else, some other folks want to be a part of that discussion, maybe a model to make sure that the, the COSH has what it needs there may be a need to be an entity outside of it to think through policy in general and um, and bring that back then to the next meeting for for uh, making it formalized okay uh -huh. okay dr plitska how about cp we in your work group uh, well i think uh, I'm of two minds. Uh, on one hand, we could, again, uh, consolidation is good. Uh, one of the, some of the issues that are maybe two issues that are unresolved with CPWE, uh, how we're going to pull in the metrics for first defining them. We're almost there on that. But we haven't talked a lot about how they'll be gathered with CPAN and TCHAT. Uh, I think that's that process is much further along, for instance, is Trait going to continue to be involved with CPWE? I think that's an open question right now. Um, the other issue is, I think, uh, will there be a need for the expertise of the LMHA representatives in terms of guiding the academic members? And uh, uh, so, so those are those are two, and, and those two things are, are particularly unique to CPWE. And one question: whether the workforce should continue at least a few more months to kind of focus on those things. But I, I'm open to input from other uh, CPW workforce members on what their view of it is. Okay. So from my standpoint, I'd, I'd like to see your group continue. Um, there, I, I have some uh, additional thought. It's not just about being able to advise, but also about being able to carry the value out to our system. So when I have representatives uh, on that committee involved in that dialogue, and we turn to uh, talk to other local mental health authorities involved, particularly as we see the, the interface around data collection and input and all of those things, I think more time is needed before we consider um, disbanding that particular group. Uh, that, that tends to be my view as well. Okay. <clears throat> I, I, I can add to that. I definitely would support that continuing. Um, I think we, we had at least one member who was from one of the LMHAs, um, Dr. Gutierrez, and I don't think he's been at some of the meetings, but I really think it's important that that whoever the, um, the head of the medical directors for the LMHAs for the state, I think if we had them at the meetings, um, it would really enhance uh, the work we're, we're doing, so. Okay. So I can certainly reach out to the medical directors group and the chair of that group um, and uh, think that could be of, of value as well. Um, Dr. Gutierrez, I actually thought about reaching out to him and seeing uh, he wasn't on the last Zoom call uh, conversation that we had for sure. Um, I kind of anticipate that he's been uh, quite involved in deploying around COVID-19 response and uh, probably his time, um, you know, pretty well taken up with that. So I, I'll bet that's it. And, and he's a great member and he's very involved at the medical group. So he can still even be part of carrying that back into that group as well. Uh, Dr. Dr. Swanee, who's in the HHSC, he's been very active and sent me a lot of good material after the last workforce meeting so we can get him more involved as well. He's particularly interested in, uh, you know, the academic public interface aspect of this. So we'll, we'll keep him involved as well. And, and he also connects with the medical uh, services consortium uh, that we have as well. So 
And I think what I, what I, I, up to now, I think all the sites have been involved in contracting and taking their initial steps. Uh, we're probably now at the point where they actually the workforce group needs to get more active and have kind of standing meetings. Uh, so I'll, I'll be, if we're going to go forward, uh, I'll go ahead and, and query the group for a, a, you know, a regular meeting so we can start working on these issues. No, it sounds like there's additional work. You know, we heard earlier today additional um, demand for those services, and so trying to figure out how do we do that and, and fill that need. Uh, we we can we heard some. Uh, you know, Michael talked several weeks ago, or several months ago related to telemedicine and, and how that we could do things maybe a little bit different. So if you would, Dr. Pliska, just look at your group, make sure you have the right members there think through kind of what are some of those tasks that we need to accomplish and uh, focus on and um, just got and, and so not to dissolve it but but to rethink what the next phase of that work group is what are those critical tasks and maybe bring it to the group and kind of kind of get rechartered you know related to what the group is who's on it and, and where do we need to move does that sound reasonable that is very good i'll take care of that okay Elizabeth, Dr. Newland, she on yet? I'm on. Okay. So with the fellowship work group, uh, what are your thoughts related to the continuation of, of the, the fellowship work group? Um, I don't think that it necessarily requires a work group. Okay. <laughs> so more of a point person and um, conversations here with the executive committee, would that work right now? I think so. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. I stand is, with what, I stand what, with the chair. You stand <laughs> with the chair. Okay. So I'm. Anybody have any a, a difference of opinion related to that? Okay. So so why don't we stop that work group? And we'll still rely upon you, Dr. Newland. I think you've been very helpful to us in the executive committee and uh, working with the different HRIs kind of where we are. Um, I, I hope I'm not assuming too much that, you know, that, you know, I'm assuming that you'll still be, be our point person to be able to assist us with, with that information. Is that okay? Sure, I'd be happy to. The only thing I would add is those that have a, um, a planning grant or are working on planning for a child fellowship program, I think, um, it's possible some of those um, HRIs might appreciate some help from others who have gone through that process and who have encountered um, some struggles along the way. And um, I would be happy to connect people with, um, with those who have gone that, gone that route and gone through the process. And, um, so please let me know if I can be of help in that way as well. Okay. Any other conversation? Hearing none, Dr. Tominga, Carol. Yeah, um, the, this, this is the conversation about the research uh, work group. Um, the research work group did a lot of work together and, and finally the uh, networks were born and that in itself seemed like a lot. Um, the networks now, each one of them have their own um, projects to do. They're really in an implementation phase. They're not in a phase where they need much in the way of input other than uh, to follow the uh, methodology that's really been set up. Um, what I've done lately is to kind of straddle the networks to be sure that the networks kind of move in sync and stay somewhat similar to each other. Um, really, the work, the research work group has really reconformed themselves and extensively uh, the research work group is a part of each one of sometimes both of the uh, projects. So um, I think that if, if in fact each of the networks is able to um, generate 500 or 1,000 population groups by the end of the study, there may be reason for the research work group to pull together again and to take a look at that and comment on it. Um, but at the present time, I think that each of the research groups are 
are, are pulling in the saddle really well and are under great leadership uh, with Charlie and Maduker. Um, maybe one could consider something like a committee suspension, <laughs> not a complete uh, dissolution, but just a kind of a, a put on hold. That would be my thought, really. Okay. Any other thoughts? My own two cents would not would be to not let the what we're calling for now the research work group um, um, atrophy. That I think. Say it a little louder, Joe. Big part. Say it a little louder. I'm sorry. Uh, that the research work group shouldn't atrophy by having some sort of hiatus. I think um, uh, nothing about anybody in particular, or uh, but just in general, I think that there is probably still a need for someone, for some body besides the entire executive committee to ponder things as they're chugging along and look at um, progress reports, all that sort of thing. Uh, uh, I wouldn't, so anyway, that's, that's my thought, that I think uh, it doesn't have to be a uh, bi-monthly sort of catch up and a chance to sort of look at the big picture about where we're going, are these projects going in the direction that the um, we had hoped that there are needs for mid-course corrections that, as having led projects like this, I'm, I'm the first to admit that I wouldn't necessarily see if I were the, the one on the spot. Um, so I'm in favor of uh, keeping, um, uh, keep, keeping it going, perhaps with bi-monthly consultation. Okay. Any other thoughts, recommendations on that, on that group? I think my thought about that would be we need to be very, very specific about what those tasks are because um, when you have that, there's so many entities involved already and, and is the research group the, the correct um, or, or most efficient way to do that or is leadership from the different nodes um, who are already involved. I totally understand and, and um, think that that's a really good idea about that mid you know, cycle course correction opportunity, um, but just thinking about how many meetings they're having and how many voices are going to be there between the leadership from the nodes, um, all meeting with the hubs, all meeting together, um, that that's a lot of, it's a lot of messaging back and forth. And so just being really, really clear on what that role would be if there was an additional continued um, meeting component. So I, I want just, to follow up just on what- I would ahead, just Peter. add, Carol, that um, that the the major uh, leadership of members of the executive committee are integral members of each of the hubs, and so Israel and Michael Escamilla, Eric Storch, Carol, uh, Karen Wagner, uh, are already involved in the integral workings of the groups. And once the protocols are settled, really the major issue is the the uh, recruitment of 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 into subjects, so again, we can show the legislature that we have a working research network. Now there will be a publication committees and other committees that will be looking at the output, and the hubs have established those committees. Michael Escamilla, Jair Soares, for example, are involved um, uh, very much. So to add another layer of oversight. Um, I don't think is particularly necessary at this time. So I want to add on to a minute what Charlie just said and what Sarah said, um, and that, you know, the uh, research work group, once they got the research program ready, handed over leadership to the two leaders and the group groups that they set up, handed over that leadership. And I would wonder whether there would be a confusion of leadership between an ongoing research work group and the leadership that's set up. You know, I, I wouldn't want there to be, I guess, that's what I would say. And that, and that, the, and that the leadership, the scientific leadership uh, is really the same as the practical methodologic leadership. And it's really been pretty much transition. 
And you know, if we if this was going to be a ten year study, I may I may have some different ideas. But we're this is like a a year and a quarter study, so we're going to be before we really need some more leadership in the in the two networks. We're going to be at the end of the study. I'm not seeing it as leadership particularly, uh, or in any way competing with the operational issues, but. Uh, my concern would be I wouldn't want to overly institutionalize these particular networks, that these networks are formed to do a particular project. And let's see what happens in a year or, or whatever at the end of this, exactly. of this project period. Maybe these weren't the right topics to pursue or pursue in the right way. Uh, whereas if we're now making the network these self-standing entities that are um, um, where that kind of programmatic review is not built in at some other level besides the executive committee, uh, I don't think is a good idea. So that's why I suggested, Joe, that we just maybe put something on, put this on hold until we get to the end of the study when um, once we have, once we have some um, um, data to really look at, but it's the, the committee's responsibility, the overall committee has a responsibility for that. I'm going to stop talking. Mike has got his hand up. <laughs> yeah, um, <clears throat> I, I was going to suggest something more along the lines of what Carol is saying that I think the, the research work group could step back for a while now. And, um, but I do think it's going to be important um, you know, let's say a year from now, as we start to think about where, what else we might want to do on the research side, besides those two particular networks. So I, I think it's good to keep it, um, you know, still as a committee, but I don't think it really needs to be involved in um, the operations of the two networks right now. Dr. Plitska, your hands up, and then Karen. I would I would agree with with Mike. I think, and with the caveat that I mean, each of the networks have a committee governing them that has broad representation. As long as that's strong, and those work groups, the depression and trauma, meet regularly and oversee things, and then if there's an issue, it could be elevated up to call a special session of the research committee uh, if there's some issue that can't be resolved, if the network issue or goes beyond what the network is supposed to be dealing with, okay. as long as the structure remains intact. The fine line between dormant and comatose is all I'm saying. So <laughs> it was, uh, that's why, uh, well, it's okay, well, let's forget about it for a year. It's, uh, uh, that might be a bridge too far. You know, what we could say is that is that perhaps the committee can stay dormant, as you would say, Joe, and that they uh, th that the overall <laughs> research work group could be addressed by either one of the networks when they got to the point where they felt they need needed this kind of oversight. I know Charlie may want to say something about that. Let me let me get Dr. Wagner in and then, then Dr. Wakefield and, and Israel and then Dr. Trevetti. So, so Dr. Wagner. Uh, yes, I was just going to support what uh, Carol had proposed, that there be a hiatus in the um, research uh, committee. The, the nodes are functioning well. It's an extraordinarily ambitious project to get done within a year span of time. And um, with all the broad representation on it, um, I think it's accomplishing its goal. I get concerned about adding another layer that, that may not be necessary at this point that is a distraction to getting the work done. So I think people have to figure out how they're going to be using their time and recruiting subjects, getting these things running is essential. But not, not that the research committee is disbanded, but it just isn't active at this time. Dr. Wakefield? Right, I wanted to bring up um, in, in response to Dr. Blader's um, good point about the, the course correction thing. Is there a role for the program evaluation committee in you know, looking at that um, also to just not duplicate other things that we are doing? That if we have a program evaluation team, not committee, I guess I used the wrong word, but team who's working on looking at all of our um, overall initiatives and how they're being implemented and if we're being successful is that is the research um, piece of that included in that program evaluation? It could be. So, so let's 
let me think through that a little bit. Dr. Liberzon, Israel? Yeah, I was thinking about it because um, through all this discussion, um, and I'm at two um, minds, and I will share briefly about them because it has to do with all of the com working committees. Um, I think working committees have specific, work groups had specific tasks. One of the tasks was to define the mechanisms, how we're going to be administering those um, monies and the um, exact processes involved. These have been in a way accomplished. And even those, some of the monies that um, have left for the research, I think you appropriately moved back to the executive committee process decision. I think that's exactly what needed to be done. And I think from that perspective, the work groups have completed their job. I think there's another job that people are talking about, and I agree. Uh, and that's the steering or advisory, whatever you want to call that. And that's overseeing general functioning of those things and translating the legislative intent and the whole uh, executive committee opinion into specific advices to, to either research networks or to the CPAN or TCHAT and so on. For that, I think we need either steering committees or advisory committees, which are subcommittee of the executive committee for each particular task or whatever, or maybe for two tasks, one, it doesn't matter. But they have a little bit different role that should not have executive decision process. They should not have a budget control process, but they should be in the process of advising and helping to, to translate general principles into specific, uh, specific steps not necessarily operations that Porsche will be doing. But what do we need? Do we need another network? Do we need to do something else? Do we need, maybe the network, is, as Joe suggested, maybe we're so unsuccessful in one of the network that we need to rethink our approach. It could be that, it, and for that a steering kind of steering group will be important. I don't think that, that um, Evaluation group has enough expertise to do that for the research network. Not, not, not close to that because they're looking in a really different mm -hmm. fact. I think you have to have a researcher, senior researchers for that purpose to help redefine or in the next year or year and a half when the we are lucky enough to get funding extended is what, how we're going to be expanding our work will it be within the network will it be in addition to the network and if within network what kind of direction it should take um so i i'm at two um at two minds one mind that i do believe that in the current form the um the work groups basically completed their job and they have to reformulate their constructs and what their task and the second is as advisor or steering committee that uh, X has expertise in a particular area, supporting each of the projects and being called for particular purpose, that I think is also important to have. So that's, I, I pretty much said what I had to say. Thank you, Dr. Liberzon. Dr. Trevetti, you're trying to get in there a little bit ago, and then I'm gonna go to Dr. Vo. So I, I, I think, uh, again, having had, run these kinds of networks. I think oversight is wonderful and I, I think the executive committee is providing it. There is, so I, I agree with one mind of, from Dr. Liberzon. I think we will need to think about how to construct some group that oversees because the research work group, there is a structural issue because the research work group is also made up of all the node leads. So it is a kind of both sides on there. So it may be that the executive committee either becomes that group or identifies a subgroup that is not in the trenches because we as the node, uh, as the network are involving all the node leaders all throughout this process. And then to have some of them separate out to give advice becomes a little com complicated. Okay. Dr. Vo. So I'm gonna agree with uh, Dr. Liberzon here um, in that a lot of the original work groups tasks were accomplished. And I think there needs to be an evolution of 
what we call work groups. We're now in a functional phase of things. And in addition to that, I envision if we, if the consortium is allowed to continue years on from, you know, the initial start of this, is that at some point, all these lanes, the CPAN, T-chat, research, evaluation will cross over and intermingle at some point and be integrated. And so perhaps we could think about, you know, a, a cross-functional group that kind of helps steer policy, uh, you know, best practices uh, to help facilitate that kind of integration down the road. Um, and to have, to call it a steering committee or, or you know, it is it invokes kind of like guidance or oversight. And I don't think that's really what these work groups are intended to be in the first place. They're intended to start the initiative, but now the initiatives have started, we probably should focus on how we can help it function better. So perhaps that's what we could think about in terms of, uh, you know, direction. Okay. Dr. Blader. Uh, yeah. Uh... I like the way that Israel put it, that I think it is time to uh, uh, mature this, this element into uh, something more like a steering committee and probably broaden the, the membership to include outside consultants and other people who can full, full, fulfill that role um, appropriately. Because I think as, you know, as Charlie mentioned, it is uh, there's almost a little too much overlap um, between uh, the research committee as it is mm -hmm. and the people who are actually involved in doing this stuff. It's almost a, a, a little bit of a conflict. Uh, so I think it should be expanded and involve other folks from, uh, you know, from outside to help us. Dr. Nimroff, and then I'm going to need to move forward in, in, in the conversation. But, but Dr. Nimroff? Yeah, Lu Luann um, reminded me that we should have a bit more of a conversation about the role of the Acculturation, Equity, and Patient Advocacy Committee uh, for the research networks. So I'm going to ask Michael to sort of summarize. I mentioned this earlier, uh, but I want Michael uh, uh, to summarize. But I'll briefly say that um, you know, there are several issues related to what scale we were going to use related to ethnic, uh, ethnic identity. Um, we wanted someone who could coordinate input from Stephanie and David uh, from the patient advocacy side. And so uh, let, me, let me just ask Michael to sort of describe the work of his committee for both of the networks. Um, yeah, Charlie, I could do that, but I, I, I'm a little worried it's going to get us off track of... Um, well, they wanted to hear it, so it's take two minutes. Okay, I'll give you a quick. So, <clears throat> so this was a, a committee that um, Char Charlie asked um, to, to, for me to lead and put together um, to advise the trauma, trauma network. And I think I haven't had uh, conversations with Maduka yet, but we might also be doing stuff for depression. Um, but basically it's a committee, uh, Char Charlie, um, you know, um, uh, put, put the members together. Um, it's myself, Dr. Uh, Martinez, um, and then um, I'm blanking on his name right now. Uh, Dr. Tony uh, Talibi. Talibi from uh, uh, Austin Dell. And we had a fourth member, um, Michael Guerra from Lubbock, but he was not able to participate. So we, we kind of have an opening to add another person. But basically what, what you know, we've been tasked to do uh, initially was to help with, uh, a lot of the forms didn't have Spanish translations. So we've been working to get uh, Spanish translations ready and uh, tested out before we um, you know, start recruiting patients. And we're also looking at uh, questions such as, uh, can we broaden uh, to other, other languages? Um, and, um, you know, um, working on specifics about the acculturation measures and how we're, we're gonna look at that. So we've, we've, been, uh, we've met to work on that. And um, that's in, in essence what the, the committee is. So it advises on those issues to Charlie. Michael, Michael and I would very much 
like to have uh, someone to represent the African American community on this committee. And um, one of the one of the tasks we'd like to ask your help if there's someone in your network, in your nodes, in your institutions that you think would fit that bill, we'd be really appreciative. Okay. Charlie, I'm going to suggest Danielle Wesley. Um, who's sitting right next to you on my screen? She's oh. from Children's Hospital, and maybe she would, uh, maybe she would uh, um, so, um, volunteer. So, so um, let me. I, I want to get us back on the track for for this question, and, and I, I think uh, Charles, you know, the the other committees. I, I think maybe next next time we meet, we can have a fuller discussion of and, and alternate between the the two different research projects uh, in, in order to make sure we get the the, the right oversight um and it's on, on that committee and, and why, why don't we again i i get a little bit nervous of doing things by fiat putting people in charge or whatever on the committee um in an executive meeting and so, so i th think through who that is danelle if you want to do that, that that's great uh, if you don't i don't want to put pressure on you right now and if there's other people that you want that that that, that uh, uh, dr nimroff I, I think that would be great i, I think for this issue though of, of this work group, um, I, I guess kind of where I am hearing things and kind of my feel of things is, is that 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 work group that we had before to get us here probably isn't the work group we need to move move forward. That that there could be, we, we don't want it to interfere with the work of the, the, the nodes. Uh, I also have tried to take things and pull them up to the executive committee, especially with some of the dollars, et cetera, to make sure that all the institutions are part of that conversation. Uh, I think there are other institutions that would like to be involved more in some of those conversations of where the research initiatives go, et cetera. And so I, I think it would be good to pull those things up to this group right now. And I guess my advice, and again, I'm happy to hear otherwise, is to, to put that current one on hold, pull things up to this executive committee, have a component of this meeting alternating between the two research nodes that, that are part of this. Think together as the executive committee of where it needs to go. And then if we identify that there are really some particular issues that we need to delve into further, think through what a new research committee or a steering committee would, would look like, but it'd be different than the old because there's additional folks that felt like they should be part of those conversations. Does that make sense to people? Sounds good to me. Okay, so we're gonna put that on hold. I think at the next meeting, uh, Dr. Nemiroff will have you have at one of the sections. Uh, at the following meeting, uh, Dr. Trevetti will have you present of the um, the advancements. And so every two months, you guys will be reporting to us uh, at least while we're meeting once a month right now. Just alternate between the two of you to, to hear how things are going and get the input from the entire executive committee. And as I noted earlier, there are some key decisions that we will set up to make that decision as a whole related to how those dollars will be used. Okay. Good to set up a little competition between the networks, you know, performance <laughs> competition. <laughs> we are all one, one, one big <laughs> research project. Okay. And Any David, this is- have strong feelings about me not moving forward in that way. No, but this is Danielle, and I put that I'd be more than happy to assist. Okay, thank you. I still want to put pressure on you in the middle of a meeting to, to, to volunteer. So um, that sounds great. Um, so what I, what I heard, research committee on hiatus, and we'll pull it up to the executive committee and then decide after a while what we need to do next. That CPWE continues to have uh, need, but we need to recharter it and think of what the new goals are for, for it and who additional members are. That the fellowship program that really don't need that work group anymore, but uh, Dr. Newland will continue to report to us and, and kind of be a point person for, for those issues. And that uh, we will hear back from Dr. Williams related to the work group for CPW and TCHAT and, and figure out what what that looks like. And you'll work with Luann to think through if there needs to be additional policy component, um, either in the cost or outside the cost to, to advise on those policy issues. Um, I, I think that's where we heard 
what I heard. And then uh, the desire to set up, Luann will be working uh, with Octavio to, to figure out what a, a, a group for consumer peer voice would be like and how that fits into all the work that we do. Okay. Did, did I misunderstand anything? Okay. All right. Let's move forward then to number eight uh, on the agenda related to the, the fiscal years. Luanne, you want to set up this conversation and then we'll go to Stacy Silverman to talk about some of the authorization work. Yes, as you all know, it is the last quarter of the first year of the biennium, the first fiscal year of the biennium. And so many of you have asked numerous questions about the budget um, relating to closeout for 2020, relating to unspent funds from the 2020 budgets, because um, as you know, ramping up new things often takes more time than we might think. And so we haven't spent as much revenue as we may have anticipated during the first year of the biennium. Additionally, with COVID-19 um, entering the picture for us, that has slowed us down as well in some areas and has kept us going in others despite uh, COVID-19. So um, there's also been some questions about the need for allocation of resources into 2021. Now that you have been operating Briefly in 2020, you have a little bit of a better idea of where some of your needs might be in terms of expenditures. And you may have underprojected in some expense line items and overprojected in others. And so there's been some questions about what to do about that as we head into a new fiscal year for 2021, starting on September 1st. So um, I wanted to set aside, we wanted to be sure to have some time on this agenda to talk about that and look at some of our processes that we'll lay out and have in place for us as we go from 2020 into 2021. So um, that is why this is on the agenda. Uh, and on the first item, we did ask um, if Stacy Silverman, who is with us from the Texas Higher Education Coordinating Board, hi Stacy, um, if she could provide us with just some information and answer some, any questions that you might have about appropriations, et cetera. So Stacey, I'll, I'll pitch it off to you, just start. Thanks so much, Luann, and thank you to everyone who is on this wonderful consortium. I, I have to say, I've been listening as much as I possibly can, and the work that you all have done is just admirable. Um, I loved hearing about the CPAN and the TCHAT and the research work that you're gonna do. Um, and I just really want you to know how, how much that I see the, the work that you all have are already undertaken and you're moving along just beautifully. So well done. Um, additionally, your funding, even though you didn't spend all your money, it, it actually just will be moved forward into the next fiscal year. You have what's known as unexpended or UB balance authority. So you have UB authority, so that money will move forward with you. So you will have access to it. And again, if you need to make changes to your budgets, I believe you guys have a, an ability to move around 10% without asking. Um, and then if you do need to move more than that, you just need to document it. So I'm a big fan of thinking like an auditor and documenting everywhere you can. So please document and show your work. Um, this is one of those important places that you can do that because you don't want to get five years down the road and have an auditor who doesn't know exactly what you were doing um, come in and it gets very difficult to explain those things having been through more than one of them myself. Um, I'm happy to address any questions that you have and happy to, to note that we're working to get uh, funding off to the Health Science Center, that, that's going to be approved by the comptroller for the San Antonio piece as well. So happy to answer any questions at this time. Let, let me jump in first and thank you, Stacy, uh, uh, and your agency for the support that they've been providing us. That, that it really has been pretty quick related to us approving a budget, handing it off to you, and then you 
once we get the information from institutions, getting the money to our institutions. So thank you for, for that work. Um, a, one, one quick point and, and kind of a word of caution for, for all of us related to carryover authority, UB authority, is that yes, we have that ability to move money over from year one to year two, but be very careful that you don't increase your year two obligation going into the next biennium more than what we've already obligated. That sometimes that UB authority can be used, you know, used for one-time costs or things, but if you, um, we, I think we'll be fortunate if we get the $115 million from this very tough upcoming legislative session. Uh, sometimes agencies do this game of, of not spending in year one, obligating it all in year two, and then thinking that that will be their burn rate in the future. Um, we shouldn't assume that. And, and so assume that what we put down in year Year two will probably be our burn rate. We'll, we can think through how do we use those unspent dollars for things that are gonna enhance the consortium. Um, there's some opportunities I wanna talk about a little bit later that we, and how do we go through that prioritization. But we need to be careful that we don't so underspend in year one, you move it all in year two, and then you're in a hole when you come into year three. That makes sense, Stacy. Yes, Dr. Lakey, that makes perfect sense. And I, I'll just remind everyone that you have you have UB authority from year one to year two, but from year two to year three, you get your new appropriation. And that any leftover money in year two that's not obligated will get swept away. So that's something to be cautious of as well. I have a question. Alex, go ahead. It's, uh, it's more of a logistic request. Uh, you know, for a lot of us who are at the HRI level, you know, managing some of these things, we have to interact with multiple CFOs and VPs of finance and et cetera. And sometimes it's kind of difficult for us to explain, you know, what transpired in the executive committee around finance and what we can do or cannot do with some of these funds. and. And uh, so would it be possible for system or the executive, uh, man the management team for the consortium to send out a note to all of us res with respect to the U UB authority, what we can or cannot do. So that way we can actually forward it on to our financial groups. So that way they understand directly what it is that we are authorized to do and not do so that we don't misrepresent what was discussed. Because frankly, I don't think any one of us are accountants. And so, um, um, you know, we could be, I could be wrong, but I doubt it. And so we would need that assistance from you to document out what it is that we can or cannot do to give to our financial reporting uh, yep. groups. Yeah, we, we can put something together. I'll work with Luann and, and David Lean and we'll put something, and, and Stacy, and we can put something together and make sure that there's clear understanding of the UB authority, uh, the, the lack of you know, be, being careful related to um, the, the obligation going into year three, that the ability for you to transfer between programs, uh, we, we can put that all in a, another letter and, and send it out to folks. Okay. So, Continuing this conversation, though, the we, we, we put in the LBB report that there would be some flexing of funds uh, based on our experience, the ability to transfer within an institution 10%. But also, um, you know, as Stacy noted, that if we don't spend dollars that they, they can be, you know, at the end of year two, those could be swept and, and, and used for other things, which understanding where we are, this. Um, budget-wise for the state, you know, shouldn't surprise us any. Um, but we also put in th that we would be able to flex between institutions um, if we saw that there were additional needs and, and that we put in the LBB report that, that one of the hot top priorities would be T-Chat, that if there were some opportunities to flex if some entities saw that they could expand to other schools, if there are unused money in one institution, that there may be ways that we could ex expand that. 
Um, we said that was our top priority, not the only a priority. I, I've also heard among this group, and I noted one of those earlier, that some good ideas have been brought uh, to this group uh, of how you could use additional funds, whether it was for residents uh, or, or fellows or, or with um, telemedicine support to local mental health authorities and some other type of initiatives that, that could be uh, could be brought up pretty quickly if there were some funds uh, available. And so we're, we're gonna need to, to look at that and get that information from your institutions related to how much money do you really think you can spend? Um, are there some additional opportunities that you think we ought to take a look at? And like we did with the, the research dollars kind of set up that, that process. And, and so, uh, over the next two months, we, we need to get that done. And, and so actually, Lachelle, I might bring you in to the conversation to, to talk about that a little bit, but she'll be sending you some information. Again, trying to look at what your actual expenditures are gonna be, what you think some other priorities could be uh, if there were funds and, and, and how they would be built in. How do we look at sustainability on that? And come August, think through if there's any kind of reallocation that would need to take place. Lachelle, anything you want to add to that? Um, the only thing I would add is we, we have developed a template and my intention is to fill that those templates um, with the information you've al already provided us so you're not having to um, re-enter a lot of this. If you feel comfortable with the actuals and your forecast for um, Q4, I can plug that into the template as well. So that gives us an idea of what we think is actually going to roll forward um, into next year. Um, in the spreadsheet itself, there's a couple of areas where you would enter what do you think you're actually going to spend, and then uh, you can see what you projected for next fiscal year, and you have the opportunity to enter a, a new budget. Uh, and then there's a summary that says, okay, across all of my four programs, here's what I think is going to be uh, left over, or here's where I think I have some additional financial needs. And there, there'll be an area where you can say, this is what I would like to do in terms of transferring funds between uh, uh, cost types and projects. And it, if you were short of funds, it's an area where you could talk about, um, I guess, expanding your services and why you think that's um, uh, necessary or would be good um, use of the funds. And then as a system uh, or as a, 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 I guess, a portfolio of programs, we will look at all of that and then have to make a determination about which areas um, are going to give us the biggest benefit. And so when Dr. Lakey talks about coming back and, you know, this taking a, a approximately two months, uh, the timeline that we would like to recommend um, within the PIAs we have added some language that says that you will give us those carry forward and uh, new projections for next fiscal year by the end of July. That'll give us some time to consolidate all those numbers and look at the requests across the board and then uh, maybe make some recommendations to this committee in August. So one, let's stop there because this can get, again, get confusing. But uh, again, I want to be a good steward of these dollars. Uh, again, if, if there's good projects um, and we would be having to give the money back, uh, you know, I, I want to make sure that we have that opportunity. Um, but I also want to do it in a very transparent way and, and let the legislature know if we're flexing dollars here and there in order to meet these needs. Any questions related to that? Again, we're going to be sending you information. You're going to need to get that information back. We will come back with what we hear of where there may be some opportunities to flex dollars to meet the needs uh, of, of Texans. And then um, it will be up to the executive committee to approve any of those adjustments that, that are made between institutions. Again, within your institution, you have that ability to, to make a 10% flex of the dollars. The only thing I would add is looking at everybody's burn rate right now, um, from this last, the, the quarterly reports that were just submitted, we had about 2.5 million out of the 24.8 million that was um, provided for this fiscal year. So just a little bit more than 10% that everybody spent so far. Um, it, although the projections for next quarter are looking a lot higher as everybody starts getting their programs off the ground. Um, but if we're looking to 
keep um, 51 million, 51.1 million is what we had um, allocated for next fiscal year. So if we, if I, if I look at the numbers right now, we could potentially have 14 million that isn't spent this fiscal year that would roll forward into next year. And we have to think about, uh, you know, to your point about not increasing operational overheads, what, what we would do with those funds. Steve Pliska, you were leaning forward like you were going to ask a question, yeah. and you took yourself off. I, I raised my hand as well. Oh, there you go. I didn't even see it. Sorry, man. <laughs> no problem. Followed all three rules. Uh, the uh, so uh, early July is is I think, and I think this is probably true for everybody. July, August, September, we're going to see a big ramp up. People we've recruited have come on board, so we of course we'll be careful about making sure we project those forward. Uh, secondly, we'll have. We're continue, most of us are continuing to recruit. And admittedly, if, if we're six months into next fiscal year, we haven't hired somebody, you probably won't. But by the end of August, I'm still gonna be hopeful that I'm gonna hire another faculty. And I wouldn't want those, I'd wanna keep those doc dollars sequestered locally. Um, the, uh, and then thirdly, I think, yeah, the, the when we get to that point of reallocating, we, I, I would double down on how transparent that process needs to be. Um, it can't be, you know, the first asks is the first get, you know, we have a great program over here. Uh, let, you know, we, everybody's got to have equal uh, claim. And then obviously if we have a local project that we can do with the funds we haven't spent, that should kind of have a priority provided the whole committee uh, uh, approves. And, and finally, I guess it would have to be a project that we would complete by the end of the fiscal year, because we don't want those extra dollars, they can't roll over into our ongoing operational dollars in subsequent years. So now that's a big mouthful there, but did, do you, did, everyone, is, did everyone see those kind of points I was laying out? I, I think that's a good summary. Yeah, we, we, we are committed to being very transparent. Um, <laughs> I've thrown out some ideas just to start the conversation, but I understand that there will be other good ideas and it's not just first come, first serve. And uh, we, we need to be careful, as, as you noted, related to the, the obligation going into year three. Dr. Lakey, I'd like to make a suggestion that um, in this conversation, it reminded me that one of the things we likely need to do then is to have some criteria that the executive committee would use to make determinations about where those priorities should be. Um, and so um, I would welcome any member of the consortium to provide um, those. For example, if uh, I'm just going to throw one out just as an example. If there are more children and, and youth that could be served in a project, um, that may be a priority uh, in terms of direct service or you know, developing one additional uh, position for a physician in an LMHA. I mean, I'm just, I'm just trying to think ahead about you know, how would you as a consortium make decisions then if let's say 10 proposals came in from across the state, how would you as a consortium decide what those priorities would be if those funds were limited. So um, we can work with you and I would be more than happy to hear from you about what you think those should be so that there could be a, a, a neutral process that's used across the board to make those decisions. So with the, the one caveat that um, the, the LBB report is kind of our Bible on how we're moving this Absolutely. forward. And, and so we Absolutely. said each chat and, and, and then the other specific programs that we've listed in the, or, or listed in the statute. Yeah. I, I, guess, I guess the one area that we have to be careful on um, is that I, I think the legislature would be concerned if we moved dollars out of direct services uh, into research. And so we really have a cap on the, the dollars for research um, that, that were given. Um, the, these dollars of flexing would be doing more T-chat, more CPAN, um, maybe think, you know, novel ways with the local mental health authorities. I, I think those are the, the main main areas that we would need to focus on. And 
and also just so everyone's aware, we do indicate as well that we do need to notify the LBB for sure um, about any substantial changes. So yeah. that would also take place. Any other questions? Okay. Michelle, is there anything else related to this item, not item number eight, that, that we need to talk through about the budgets? Um, I don't think so. Just keep an eye out, I guess, for, for those templates for us to send out with some instructions. Um, I will pre-populate them with the information that I have. and. Uh, if you have any questions or concerns, just reach out. When do you anticipate sending those out? Um, fair, probably by the end of next week. I think I can have everything put together and sent out. I've already got the template, um, and, and I, uh, I, I just need to put input the data for everybody. Okay. All right. So that's the. Full agenda. Um, Luann, were you going to say anything? I was just going to ask if everyone feels like that's a reasonable time frame for you. In July. In between, um, we will also set up an email as uh, Dr. Vo requested for your financial folks. But we'll send it to you for you to forward on. Thank you, Luann. One of the problems that I've run into is that I calculated certain things on and called them an FTE. Like, and when, as I learned more about what IT does, I'm kind of like you, Laurel, what does IT really do? And you know, there's lots of different levels of IT. There's the IT person that will come in and plug your computer in and turn it on and then walk out of your room. There's the IT person that will consult you through a particular program. There's the IT person that will actually get you a new computer, wipe the disk and then that term they use when they do something to it, format it or brush it, or they there's a term for that. And then there's an, another IT. And so my people are going, but who is that FTE? And I'm going, oh my God, no, it's not, it's not a person, it's a thing that all of these people have to do. Well, how am I going to track that? It's like, so anything financially you could help with would help me immensely because that tends to be where I get drugged into a conversation with the accountants that makes me go crazy. Sorry for people who are accountants. I'm not saying anything bad, but I need to, I need to learn your language because I'm not going to talk in terms of ions and affinity and, and lethal doses. I, will, I, I need to learn how to talk in the financial term of it's not an FTE, but you said it was an FTE. It's like, well, yes, it is an FTE, but it's an FTE for these things. Help, whatever you can do to help Luann would be, Lachelle, wonderful, please. Just help us. Hey, I, can help with the, I can help with the FTE thing. I definitely cannot help with the technology thing. Ask anyone. They no. would, you do not want me to do that. Uh, Dr. Vo, does that, does that kind of get to where you are with your finance people? Uh, well, not really. I mean, I understand the FTE thing. I can explain to my accountant, like, you know, I need desktop support versus software support and all these things. You break it out into different realms. That's not really the issue for me. It's more of uh, encumbrances, um, rollover. Those are, you know, policy rules that goes into um, auditing that's really mm -hmm. key. And so, you know, I, I, but th that doesn't uh, minimize what you're going through. You know, it just so happens this is space I play in, so I understand that pretty well. And so, uh, but the, the other pieces that our financial folks are more concerned about is, is how do they prepare themselves to be audited in the future? And so they need documentations on what they can or cannot do, et cetera. So that way we are in compliance the whole way. That's mainly what my concern are. But not to minimize yours, Alan. So we can help. But if with you them. want to, you can call me, and I'll walk you through some FTE. It, it's it's not. I I think I explain mm -hmm. it, and then there's the next meeting where it's like it didn't stick. And so the encumbrance. I think is, that's. I think that's a global problem with all <laughs> IT groups, to be honest with you. So finance groups, yes. <laughs> all right. 
Any other questions? Hearing none, we have completed our agenda uh, and I think I've framed the work that we need to do over the next month pretty well. So we will get back to you, at, but we'll meet again in a month and look forward to seeing how everything has progressed and kind of what the next steps are. So again, appreciate your time and stay safe and I'll see you in about a month. All right. Thanks, Thanks everybody. Bye. 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 Thank you. Thank you.